Hello and welcome to the opening ceremony for the 2022 Digital Futures Summer Festival of Workshops. Um, I, just before I start, I'd just like to thank uh, uh, Giovanna Belaka for her wonderful uh, introductory jingle, um, which is put together, really a sign of our, our international co um, collaboration. It's very Peruvian, and I'd like to thank Enrique Trellez uh, Barzola for his uh, panpipe music from Peru, um, and uh, Claudia Garcia also involved in video art, and the Ola Online Lab of Architecture for that. Today we have, I think, a very special opening ceremony in the sense that we are being incredibly inclusive. What is so significant about uh, all our speakers today, all our presenters today, is they all come from different land, from different cultures. They've come to the States or, or the UK or Europe, whatever, uh, from other countries. And it's really a celebration of the diversity of what Digital Futures stands for, that we are able to invite these uh, wonderfully talented and emerging young figures from all over the world. Okay. Uh, I'd like to just simply say something by way of a kind of, uh, of an overview um, of what uh, has happened in the last uh, 12, 12 months or so. Um, uh, Digital Futures, as uh, we all know, was founded by myself and Philip Bjorn back in 2011. Um, in those days, we had a fairly small group of uh, students from China and from American universities we gradually uh, grew over the years um, until 2019. We had the largest uh, in-person set of workshops, all completely free, um, that were operating at the time from Shanghai. In 2020, though, was really when uh, digital futures came of age. This was the moment when, uh, in response to the pandemic, we went online and we went global, and digital futures grew in an exponential fashion to become one of the, the, the most significant contributions to, to architecture education worldwide. Um, uh, 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 more, uh, and, and the whole premise about digital futures is the idea that, that we should be um, making everything available for free, trying to, as it were, uh, break down the barriers uh, and, and uh, uh, bring in, involve everyone, regardless of which country they came from, what religion they have, what gender, what age, or what economic standing. The whole idea is to attempt to, uh, to, to, to essentially to democratize education itself. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and one of the most significant things that we've done in the last year has been to, um, uh, to uh, open up uh, to different languages. Um, we started off in English, uh, Philip uh, started having a few sessions in Chinese, but from December onward, we've opened up a whole series of different sort of language channels, which has really helped to democratize and uh, spread the word, as it were. We started off with Arabic with an astonishing session that attracted over 20,000 viewers, then Farsi, then Spanish, then Portuguese. And now we're now operating in a situation where we have, we have a whole load of uh, different language ch uh, channels. And uh, uh, for this particular summer, we are operating in 11 different languages, Arabic, English, Chinese, Farsi, Spanish, Portuguese, Turkish, Japanese, Korean, uh, Greek, and, and Bengali. It is moreover the largest ever festival of workshops that we've had, um, uh, 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 that we've had uh, um, uh, with 100, 130 workshops. So Digital Futures has very much kind of grown. Um, and it's also importantly, it's also it's become Deterritorialized. It's now an online platform that operates throughout the year. Some weeks we have many sessions um, and uh, 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 in different languages. And it's a place that is deterritorialized. It uh, it has it's not uh, connected to any time zone, to any country, to any city, to any university. Instead, it's a global platform where we are sharing information with everyone um, throughout the, the world. There are a number of significant uh, events that have happened in this past year, um, including the introduction of technical tutorials uh, and also uh, the Insider series. And in many ways, we've had a, 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 an extraordinary year where the number of uh, individuals that are contributing uh, have been quite significant. Um, uh, uh, one of the other significant factors that happened uh, in the last 12 months was the introduction of the doctoral consortium and it originally referred to as the digital consortium. This was an idea that I had last year, last summer, 
Um, and we launched it. The idea was that uh, not only should we broken through the walls of the classroom, we've also established a global platform whereby we can connect, in this case, doctoral candidates and would-be doctoral candidates from all, the, all, all over the world in a shared platform. The, the, the first session we had uh, was uh, last summer, um, where we invited Slavoj Žižek to kick things off with an astonishing uh, uh, lecture. That was followed by a series of different workshops, um, including the very popular um, architecture and philosophy series, but that continued. It continued over the year where we had uh, further sessions on architecture and, and philosophy. We had a very uh, an, an amazing series on AI, neuroscience and architecture, where we had perhaps the, the most views we ever had. Um, uh, these have been, been operating throughout the year. So importantly, then, uh, what we see as digital futures is something which is a, 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 an annual platform uh, that, is, that is there the whole time. Uh, in which it provides, a, let's say, a landscape in which we can uh, operate with our different um, operations. Um, uh, and, and of course, the most important one of the whole year is the summer festival of, of, um, of, of, of workshops. Um, so here we have some of, the, some, of the, some of the doctoral consortium sessions from the past. They're all uploaded onto our YouTube channel, onto the new website that Mohamed Bejo has uh, produced for us, a very elegant website, albeit with a few glitches, but nonetheless, we will sort that out. And, and we are providing a repository of info important information for students of architecture all over the world, a repository that's been available for years to come and for free. Um, one of the significant things that we'll be uh, uh, holding this week, which is, um, has just been finalized, there's been a new series called Legends. Um, what we discovered, I think, in our architecture and philosophy uh, series was, uh, was how extraordinary, what, what, what an extraordinary platform we have for bringing free people together to record things, people who otherwise wouldn't have been together. And, and one of the sessions has included Peter Eisenman and Bernard Schumi talking about Helen Sixou and, De and Jacques Derrida was really a classic in terms of, of bringing together people and, uh, and, and really reflecting on one of the most important moments the involvement of Derrida in architecture, deconstruction, and so on, that happened in the history of architecture. We are going to continue the, the spirit of that particular series by hosting these, uh, these series of what we call, would call fireside chats with various legends in the field of architecture. We're going to kick off with Peter Eisman, one of the, one of the most interesting and, uh, figures who straddles both uh, uh, theory and design, who has been a provocateur, an energetic kind of cr critic, and, a, and somebody who's been leading the field uh, over, over the past many years, in fact. Uh, this year, Peter Eisman celebrates his 90th birthday, and it's been wonderful to, to, uh, to share with you uh, our discussions. Denise Scott Brown, one of the great icons uh, in, uh, in the history of, of architecture, and one of the great female icons, I should say, is also, we've also holding a, a discussion with her, and that is going to be very special. John Fraser is another one. Uh, John Fraser is, of course, uh, one of the kind of the godfathers of computation in, in architecture. When he was a student at the Architectural Association back in the 60s, he produced, I think, the first ever uh, uh, comp computationally drawn um, building. Odile Deck is another figure who is highly inspirational, um, uh, not only with her outrageous uh, uh, and, and uh, 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 provocative outfits and buildings, but also the way that she has contributed to education by establishing her own school of architecture. Liz Diller is, of course, another icon in many ways, uh, originally from Poland uh, and now based in New York and teaching at Princeton. Elizabeth is, is really one of the most active people in, in the scene um, and an inspirational designer also. Uh, and then finally, uh, Wolf Pricks, who was, uh, has contributed a, a lot to Digital Futures and who was awarded uh, the uh, Digital Futures Award last year for uh, the astonishing work on AI architecture that he's been doing with Daniel Bolojan, uh, Deep Pimobla. This series is something that we are planning to continue throughout the year. We have Peter Cook lined up, we have Tom Main lined up, and so on. We're going to keep this going. And, and also importantly, to, we are carefully editing the subtitles, and the idea is to be able to produce these in, in, in all our different um, languages. Um, uh, so, um, um, so, so, uh, just to go back to the to the to the, the the schedule of what we're doing today, what we're trying to do is is to um, uh, to to celebrate, as it were, the diversity of uh, of of, of um, our, our um, 
of our outreach, as it were, um, by, 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 by bringing in individuals from all over the world, now based perhaps not in the native country, but to celebrate that. And, each, and for each of our speakers, I'm going to invite um, members of our language channels to um, say, say some words of introduction, also in the native, native language. So uh, Zenit will be introducing uh, Refik Anadol. Um, and then we have uh, Angelica from Brazil, who will be introducing Mariana Cabuquera, who will be giving the, uh, an, an emerging designers keynote address, um, followed by Benaz Farahi, who uh, originally comes from Iran and who will be introduced by Mohamed Beju, who in addition to uh, um, designing our new website has been in charge of the, um, of, of the, the Farsi language channel. Uh, and then finally today, we have a very special award, um, the, the, the Mark Cousins Theory Award, which is now in its second year. And I'm delighted to have Sanford Quinter here, who is, who is I think, the leading theorist in the world. Um, and uh, 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 he will be, it, be, be saying some general remarks um, uh, about, about the theory award itself. And Giovanna Pelaca will be also introducing Ana Maria Duran Calisto, um, uh, partly in Spanish. So today then we have you know, a real kind of celebration of the diversity of, um, of uh, what is digital futures. Um, I think that we can be very proud of what we've achieved in the last 12 months, but we're looking forward to even more, to even more language channels and to even more diversity, to making this, this, this platform have a real impact on the world, uh, on, on, the world uh, on the world itself. So I'm now going to be inviting um, Philip Yuan, my colleague who uh, was the co-founder of Digital Futures uh, uh, some time ago, to say offer a few remarks on really on the statistics of what's happened on charting. Philip is very fond of charting the, the very precisely um, what is going on in in um, <clears throat> overall in terms of these statistics and so on. So uh, welcome, uh, Philip. Is Philip not here? He's there. Uh, I okay. Um, Philip, welcome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Very nice to uh, meet all the um, um, language channel uh, coordinator and also uh, the instructor uh, of some of the workshops coming to join us. Uh, because of the time difference, we have. Um, uh, Another uh, opening at a very early morning, like 12, years, uh, 12 hours ago um, uh, before the CDRF conference. Actually, we have some uh, um, um, uh, agenda or some diagrams I want to present to all of you right now. So wait a moment. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. I can see you. Yes. This is a topic this year, and we put forward one planet. I think it's a special time after COVID. Um, I think, especially this year um, in Shanghai, I'm in Shanghai, China, we have a lockdown because of the, uh, the strategy of the uh, 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 local, uh, local situation. So we suffer a lot from the environment problem and uh, including the other side of the planet with a wall. And so we need to rethinking on the technology and on the relationship between the human being and non-human beings and also all of these components right now on the planet. So uh, we uh, actually invited a special guest uh, coming to make lectures over the past three weeks uh, and uh, make a fabulous event for the whole summer. And I would like to briefly introduce the, what's happening uh, in the past two weeks. So from June the uh, 3rd, we organized a PhD consortium. And, and, uh, and Tongji would like to share all these um, uh, PhD courses to the, to the world on the platform on Bilibili and YouTube. So today is the ceremony uh, for the opening of the whole event. But at the same time, we have a long day, like 12 hours conference, um, uh, uh, subdivided by eight uh, sessions. So main topic this year is hybrid intelligence. So in the next uh, nine days, we'll have the workshops. Uh, man, uh, new already mentioned, we have more than 130 workshops will be happening. 
So, uh, and uh, the closing ceremony uh, will also follow by the, the award, the future award announcement uh, will be happen on uh, July the 3rd. So this is the main numbers of this year. Uh, we have more than 130 workshops. So, and more than 10 uh, language channels as new or dimension. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, hopefully uh, uh, all of you uh, will present uh, afterwards and uh, thanks for your contribution. Uh, to the uh, architecture uh, uh, dig uh, digital future uh, community. So these are the PhD courses actually uh, we um, organized this year. We have architecture philosophy, architecture theory, and architecture design methodology. So in next week, Patrick Schumacher will give uh, six more lectures and during the, um, uh, the workshops time. And uh, in the past few weeks, two weeks, actually, we already uh, invited around uh, uh, 14 uh, professors uh, gave lectures. But most importantly, this year, uh, Digital Future uh, Association, we launched a special journal named Architecture Intelligence. And uh, this journal actually guided by the scientific thinking uh, methodology focus on the three scenario scenarios of smart habitat, virtual habitat, and space habitat and utilizing evidence-based architectural research methodology uh, to make uh, a certain research uh, through the whole scenarios and the development of the new paradigm in architecture. So uh, welcome uh, contributors research uh, from all the PhD candidates and researchers to this journal. So this the first week actually we invited um, in the PhD course, we invited um, uh, some uh, very interesting uh, uh, researchers like uh, Daniel Bodichin, Matt Thompson, uh, Shi Chao Li, who is uh, from um, uh, UVA, gave three lectures, and Anthony Picon, uh, Isla Berman as well. So last weekend, we have four sessions. We invited uh, uh, um, uh, uh, several uh, 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 young scholars to make discussion on uh, different topics. So we spent a, a, a wonderful weekend. So this week, we just uh, uh, finished the PhD courses, I have seven professors here, including Matthias de Campo, Kiyomo, uh, Mara Capo, uh, Liam Young, uh, Peter Chuma, uh, Imro Ko, and uh, Yu, uh, Jack Wu. And so they gave a very interesting um, um, uh, PhD lectures to the students. So this like the brief background introduction. So this is a conference we today we organized. So I think uh, uh, based on the practice, we have a lot of uh, achievements uh, over the past few years and also invited uh, a prominent uh, architect and designers to present their research work. And uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, because it's academic based uh, uh, research platform. So we organized uh, in the past four years, we organized a special uh, conference named CERF, Computational Design Robotic Fabrication. So this year we have 43 papers present uh, the whole day and uh, including uh, 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 the, 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 the expertise from 28 uh, countries and from 105 institutions to make presentations. Uh, these are the keywords actually, and uh, you, you can find uh, people most interesting, uh, the topic, uh, machine learning, generative design, robotic fabrication, and uh, computational design, GAN, uh, pixel to pixel, deep learning. So uh, these are the, the keywords is utilization. Uh, and also we published several um, books, uh, which is uh, scientific uh, research-based, so we have architectural intelligence, hybrid intelligence, and uh, uh, from last year, we began to index all these research papers on Scopus. Okay, so this is the inoperative issue of uh, uh, architectural intelligence. So we have like planned to publish 15 uh, uh, essays. Uh, we subdivide them into uh, commentary. So the opening um, 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 article is from Mara Capo, who give a special topic on design and automation at the end of modernity. 
the techniques of um, um, the teachings of the pandemic article. And also New Leach, Patrick Schumacher, uh, Mar uh, Matthias Campbell are planning to uh, publish their commentary uh, 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 for, uh, as a feedback to the topic of architectural intelligence. And because it's the first uh, inaugural issue, so we have some review articles from uh, Mike Shea, uh, Aki Mangus, uh, Matt Thompson, Roland Snook, uh, Lin Borong, uh, Wu Yipeng, uh, Liu Jianlin, and also from my team, we published a paper, a special article on the uh, uh, bionic uh, lunar uh, habitat, uh, 3D printing on the on the moon. So, and also some other uh, uh, contributors. So, looking forward to physically uh, uh, print the inaugural issue at the end of uh, August. So this is the editorial, uh, uh, launch editorial already published uh, this editorial on uh, Spring on Springer platform. So welcome to, to, to read it. So that's the uh, brief introduction from me. So I would like to give the screen to, to Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, and thank you for organizing all, all those things. It's uh, a wonderful contribution to digital futures uh, that your team in China is doing. Um, so uh, now I'd like to uh, uh, be introducing our um, uh, of the, the language managers. I mean, this is really, I just want to stress, such an important development in terms of digital futures to be opening up into different languages. There's no reason why it should just be English. And we, I think, increased our, our, our range by, by opening up into uh, different languages. Um, so, uh, uh, Pavlin, could we uh, show the, vi the video? Yes, uh, I'll just request, uh, Cora, can we, uh, can we just share your screen and start the video? We can't hear sound. Cora, uh, you need to share with sound. Uh, Cora, you need to reshare with the sound. Yeah, apologies for that. We'll just reshare. Yeah. Uh, we still cannot hear the sound, yes? No, we still Uh, Bavlin, I think maybe should we should um, play yeah. later and maybe move yeah on. I think yeah with, uh, with, okay let's try try one more time okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa bihi nasta'in assalamu alaikum. Yeah, Neil, I believe we can, uh, we can't keep uh, recreating. Let's uh, okay. start with the next part and we'll come to this uh, video towards the end. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Apologies for the technical glitches there, but we'll play this later. Um, we, we move on to our, our first keynote speaker, Refik Anadol. Refik is someone I think needs no introduction, although we'll be hearing an introduction for him. Um, but Refik, I would say, is not a 
not an architect as such, he's a media artist, but he's very, very closely involved in architecture. Architecture is both the, the, his medium and his palette in the sense he's often projecting inside or onto buildings. And the past year, I think really we've seen a sort of meteoric sort of rise uh, in, in terms of his career. Uh, Refik came from, uh, from Istanbul, Turkey to the Los Angeles, like in 2009, 2012. And since then he's established himself as really a, a major star in the world. And I'm delighted to be able to have him here today um, where he can share some of his recent work, some of it extremely architectural. So I would like to, uh, invite, like to invite Zeynep to say a few words, partly in Turkish, um, by way of introduction to Refik Anadol. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Teşekkürler. Hello and welcome to the Digital Futures opening ceremony. For today, our first keynote speaker is Refik Anadol. It is a great pleasure to introduce him. Refik Anadol is a media artist, director, and pioneer in the aesthetics of machine intelligence. He currently resides in Los Angeles, California, where he owns and operates Refik Anadol Studio. The studio's research practice centered around discovering and developing trailblazing approaches to data narratives and artificial intelligence. Anadol is also a lecturer for UCLA's Department of Design Media Arts, from which he obtained his second Master of Fine Arts. A pioneer in his field and the first to use artificial intelligence in a public immersive artwork. Anadol ha has partnered with teams at Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, Intel, IBM, Panasonic, NASA, Siemens, Epson, MIT, Harvard, UCLA, Stanford University, and UCSF to apply the latest cutting edge science, research, and technologies to his body of work. And if he was in Turkish, merhaba, çalışmalarınızın sıkı bir takipçisi olarak sizlere tanıtmak ve aramızda görmek çok büyük bir mutluluk. Kısaca özet geçmek gerekirse Refik Anadol medya sanatçısı, yönetmen ve makine zekası estetiğinde öncüdür. Refik Anadol Stüdyo adı altında çalışmalara devam etmektedir. Veri alıntılarına ve yapay zekaya yönelik çığır açan yaklaşımları keşfetmeye ve geliştirmeye odaklanmıştır. Alanında öncü olup yapay zekayı halka açık bir sanat eserinde kullanan ilk kişidir. Hoş geldiniz. So it's so nice to have you and all the speakers here. Welcome to Digital Futures. Thank you so much, Zeynep, Neil, Philip. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be here with everyone that I know that we have been sharing this um, virtual space for a long time now. It's not my first time uh, with you, but it, will, it won't be my last time. Honored to be together. Um, today, I would like to share this opportunity and do my best to share our recent work. And especially, I would like to go back to the last two years, um, not too much, maybe the pandemic era, and very quickly like discuss um, our recent collaboration, which I'm extremely honored as a team with Patrick Schumacher and Zahadid Architects and also um, Antoni Gaudi's Casa Batio. I think these two architectural projects may have a, a great connection with this wonderful Digital Futures community. Uh, I would like to share my screen, give me a second. So it won't be more than 25 minutes, so I'll do my best to be on time. Uh, for everyone, I'm a media artist and as discussed, I'm right now in the last eight years teaching at UCLA Design Media Arts Department where I got my second MFA degree. And I'm very grateful for my also heroes and mentors, Keze Rias, who has been truly pioneering the, I guess, creative coding through processing and the, and the communities around it. And Christian Moller, who was a great friend of Greg Lin. And thanks to Greg Lin, I was able to work with Frank Gehry and Tom Main. So I'm very grateful for our UCLA community that allowed me to like improve my life. Uh, origin from Istanbul, Turkey, where I got my first degree and where I was able to get the idea of a left and right, west and east, all these connections of like the past and the future and designing cities on a, like a, such a culturally enhanced environments. Eight years old, got my first computer. It was a very maybe cheesy start, but I was extremely enjoyed the idea of escaping into the mind of a machine, playing games and addicted to <laughs> games till high school. And very much the same year I got extremely inspired by a movie Blade Runner. And this was a very interesting moment because I think because my age, I didn't see dystopian. In fact, I saw an utopian future. And you will see the impact of this uh, scene in my work later. 2018 was a very, uh, 2008 was a very important year. As an undergrad, I was researching the uh, media architecture 
and I was trying to understand how this medium can become my body of work. And specifically, I was super inspired by this event, which was Media Facade Exhibition in Berlin. And that was when I just met with Lev Monovich's incredible lecture. And I think what he was mentioning about the idea of working an architect and artist when they can like make the invisible visible context is where I was extremely enjoyed. By the way, his amazing piece, Politics of Augmented Space, I heavily advise you to read as well. And over the years, what was amazing in 2008, and that was an amazing lecture, uh, thanks to Koray Tahirolu, who is a uh, professor from Aalto University. And in his class, there was only three students, me, musician, and a computer science student. Three of us learned how to use pure data. It was the very first time I was able to create my very first, I guess, speculation called data painting. And over the years, this idea of data pigmentation, data, by the way, to me is not just a bunch of numbers, a form of memory start to appear. And early studies was projection mapping on the buildings and try to analyze the idea of what we see and perceive and how we can go beyond concrete, steel, and glass. And over the years, Sana's um, um, Sana School of Design Building, or also in Istanbul, did very first time three-dimensional data sculpture, which when I start thinking with parametric design or computational design. It was a three-dimensional data sculpture using three days of sound data from the street of Istanbul, 2011. And that was when I started this idea of politics of data, understanding information in life and transforming them into a meaningful forms and sculptures and paintings and so on. And over the years, what was very inspired me is not only just seeing through the lens of like two, two dimensional world, but understanding the third dimension of data. And you will see a frame in my work so much. It was a rejection in 2011, unfortunately, because of a very expensive to put a frame around the building. And since then, I just tried to speculate this idea of a living pigmentations of data and AI in this world. And if and, and as we all know, like this, 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 this situation with the systems and the hardwares, the amount of humans we have in the, on, on the planet Earth and the amount of machines we have and our connection models are becoming very important and very much un, uh, impossible to like separate from human to machines. And I think the physical and virtual world, while they come together as much as possible, I also believe that my at least my humble artistic view is our fundamental expectation from humanity is completely changing our like dna and gene is transforming and our control mechanisms are becoming a whole new entities and i think most importantly sense of displacement is completely transforming the perception of what is physical what is digital and what is that in between stage of like imagination so in my work i think as maya says design is a solution to a problem art is a question to a problem i prefer to choose the question of what does it really mean to be a human in 21st century and this question was completely out of my boundaries of information and knowledge and experience i became a team of 15 people can speak 15 language and represent 10 countries like digital features incredible vision of inclusive and try to make art for anyone any age and any background and in our studio our heavily focus is public art we do public art for anyone in the world and over the years what we learned is also the power of public art is not just a private experience like the gallery and museums when there is no like door or floor or ceiling open and equally distant to anyone in the world and last eight years we also try to like speculate the idea of embedding media arts into architecture to understand what is the capacity of like embedding media technologies into the space and we know that architecture is beyond concrete, steel, and glass, and how a, how an artist and architect can collaborate to unfold new worlds of imagination. And what was, I think, also very important in my journey in 2016, uh, when Blaise Aguera Arcas, who was also Digital Futures' amazing speaker, um, invited me and uh, many amazing engineers in San Francisco, 2016, February, in a, in a, in a project called Deep, Deep Dream. And Deep Dream was the very first time AI algorithms was becoming public and allowing creators to join this new journey of using data and AI for the creative context. And I was very fortunate that I became the first generation AI artist at Google and start working with one of the best, I guess, engineers and creators, Mike Taika, and uh, curator Kenneth McDowell, and again, Les uh, Aguirre Arcas. And that time, the idea was inventing this library of the future. If a machine can learn, can it dream questions start there? And as you see here, it's an immersive room that you can step inside in an open source free library. 
where the audience can step in and improve their self through this like experience. And as you see that there is this 1.7 million documents of the archive and can be used in this AI algorithm. To me, what was inspiring also the latent space. We learned that actually in that time, AI is not just a black box problem, but the question is how we can interact with this world of like imagination through these questions. And over the years, what was also very inspired me, like in this image on the left side, what this is a nine years of like information that is going through this uh, human interaction. On the right side, what we are seeing is about machine learning 90 minutes. I was truly impressed by the idea of like using big data and finally start this data universe projects. So 2016, 17 was an important day. And we in implemented this idea in a public space, in a public library called Archive Dreaming. And Archive Dreaming was the very first time real time exploring 1.7 million documents in a real time context, in a built environment, in an immersive context, and also in VR, AR, and XR explored as well. So this project also triggered one important question. If a machine can learn, can it dream? And I think that's when I just get extremely inspired by generative models, specifically generative adversarial, adversarial, um, uh, general, general, generative adversarial networks, and specifically, I guess, DC GAN algorithm, as you see on the left side. This, this AI model is trained on a 1.7 million documents, every single uh, paper that is scanned in the archive. And on the right side, the idea of data pigmentation started with fluid dynamics. And this last six years, machine hallucinations became a body of work and explored different data sets around the world. Last six years, we download more than 2 billion images and specifically focus collective memories, meaning architecture, urban, space, nature, things that I do believe belongs to humanity and doesn't have a personal uh, attachment or a personal private data, but something that we all perceive and have a memory in our in our consciousness. And over the years, more than 100 AI models have been trained. And 2017, thanks to Jensen Huang, NVIDIA CEO, and the support from NVIDIA, we a little bit much deeper dive into these uh, generative models and specifically working with um, StyleGAN2, StyleGAN, StyleGAN2 ADA, and PGGAN. We look for much condensed, much larger data sets and individual clusters and find different narratives in different clusters of information. So curating data in the studio is very important and training AI and then sharing with the scientists is also very important. And as you see in this quick video, last six years, every single study of different GAN algorithms created different outcomes. And, I'm, and I think I coined the term also in this um, residency 2016, AI data painting and AI data sculpture. AI data paintings are exploring more painting context as you see in these um, digital frames. And AI data sculpture is when an architectural context, large scale interventions happens in the journey. And by the way, for this project, we also last five years developed a new software called Latent Space Browser, which allows me and my team to understand what AI learned from which data and how can we connect its own consciousness into its own like um, neural activities and create narrative through the interactive AI models. And I think this memory idea, collective memory idea, not only just applies to culture or images or sound or text, but also very inspired by neuroscience. And, and last five years, 2017, I think when I start with Adam Gesley, professor at UCSF, constantly searching our Im uh, impact, our work on the mind and, and the memories in our mind as well. And I think embedding AI into architecture is another like a very profound research we do, and especially maybe a project from uh, four years ago, we researched 113 million images of city of New York and train and again an algorithm, which these images are not real, like looks like real, and then start this journey in an AI immersive sculptures, which I'm calling them also an, an escaping to the, like a mind of a machine. As you see here, this piece is uh, from Artec House Chelsea Market in New York, um, a four years ago started project, 18 channel sound, 18, 18 channel um, video projection, 32 channel sound and hyper real sound, transform an existing architectural space into a canvas.
And this project received more than 600,000 audience in just less than six months and before just pandemic, it was closed. And this is a very historic to me for our studio because our like similar um, people practicing in the immersive room such as Team Lab, I think we achieved something with data and AI, a completely new narrative that transformed the medium as well. And over the year, like in Kraftwerk, um, we also create a latent being. This time, three transformed the amazing the large scale um, turbine. Or um, recently, uh, during the pandemic, we also look for multi-model uh, AI ideas such as the scent. So we train our AI with seven to five million flowers. This is one of our GAN models. Train on seven to five million flowers, and we look we cross check our data from Smithsonian Archives with. 16,000 uh, flower species, and then transform this information into an immersive experience where, and architecturally, you can go inside. But when you go inside, we do also have a real-time scent augmentation. We work with Fermanich, a company from Geneva, and incredibly inspiring researchers who have been working with real-time AI studies to create molecules, scents, and we were able to use their AI called Charlie. And we trained Charlie on the flowers, the image, and their multimodal AI look at our AI and create a scent called rainforest. So when you enter this architectural space, there is this under the like profile, thin profiles. We generated a kind of a new system that is instantly changing the scent of the AI dreams of flowers. And I do believe this is the very first example, truly an AI multimodal creating a dream in an architectural context, in a room that is ever changing. And I think the lastly, I think this part is very important. NFTs change our thinking and NFTs and blockchain transformed our imagination. But to me, it was not about just financial models. To me, the idea of experiential imagination. And we were like very much a profound research um, again, public data, look for machine hallucinations in the space context and created many different data sculptures and paintings last five years. But this project was very important in Hong Kong last year. It was the very first time immersive room like Kusama's incredible in infinity rooms. The three dimensional space became an NFT and we mint this room itself into blockchain, which was collected by a collector later. But the room itself was the, the architectural space was the NFT or the data sculpture. And the project was received in Hong Kong and I think uh, get a remarkable, um, get a remarkable um, income. And it was a very powerful uh, transformation of our studio in the um, both blockchain scene and also art world. And later on, we worked with MoMA, which is an incredibly inspiring research thanks to Paolo Antonelli and the curators Michel Kuo, I was able to work with entire MoMA image archive and created a data universe of MoMA by looking with AI and every single like images. And with closely working with NVIDIA StyleGAN team at uh, Helsinki, we were able to create a unique AI model that was constantly dreaming real time, infinitely AI data painting. And I do believe it was the very first time and real-time infinite data paintings came into the world of art. And I'm very happy to say that working with MoMA for Artist Dream, one of the world's most inspiring museum and transforming their archive into a meaningful sculpture was a very exciting research. And over the years that I think the museums and their accept acceptance of this movement and collaboration is a big honor. And right now being in that uh, history, these names, these experiences, is a massive honor, an honor for me and the studio. So these three pieces you are seeing also real time, ever changing and transforming their self as a 101 uh, limited editions for the MoMA collaboration. And we also work with quantum computation in the pandemic. As you see here, Google AI quantum teams, incredible research allowed us to create quantum memories, which was a 1.7 million people joined us at NGV, National Gallery of Victoria, 10 meter by 10 meter media wall. The idea is coming from Hugh Everett's Many Worlds Interpretation. 
and we were able to create again interactive model by using the quantum AI's research model and we use their subatomic calculations and create a four dimensional noise that is extremely unique for the quantum research and inspire our um, GAN algorithm to generate latent walks, which then become um, the quantum memories as well, which also became NFT. But I think from this series, what was very powerful also, our piece at Art Basel Miami, where we were able to explore the nature as a canvas and bring a major uh, free open public artwork in a Fiana beach where people were able to enjoy um, the uh, enjoy this um, piece in public space. After this piece, I think we were finally received an, a very positive art critic um, and, and beautiful um, sentences about the power of public art and bring awareness to like underwater. Um, by the way, this AI trained on uh, 37 million underwater coral uh, images that are unfortunately not anymore with us. And we try to reconstruct the memories of underwater. And later on, we also did an exhibition in Berlin and St. Agnes, where we explore a different NFTs, this time the historic St. Agnes, the former brutalist architectural church, and we transformed the iconic tower into a living architecture, which is a real-time data visualizations by using the wind data from the city of Berlin, and, an, and again, an algorithm trained on the Berlin nature, and it was dreaming the Berlin while the wind data patterns were transforming the fields real time, ever changing in the form of also AI data sculpture. And inside the San Agnes, we had the nature dreams piece, which I think received more than 200,000 audience in just six to seven weeks. And I think it's the Europe's most visited gallery exhibition. And in this beautiful building, we have a, an AI trained on 300 million images of nature, water, trees, fungi, fungi flowers, landscapes, national parks, sunsets, sunrise, clouds, ocean, lakes. These fundamental topics of nature became independent AIs. And this piece was also another NFT example as well, but again, it was free and open to public as a public art first. And right now it is in saint Pompidou, Metz, and it's the very first NFT data sculpture in a museum in Paris, in, in, in France. And this, this idea of like transforming public art through um, AI data sculptures and paintings received an incredibly different reactions. But in the meantime, I saw that the power of public art, bringing people together, open, honest, and direct became a very important part of embedding media arts into architecture to bring the audiences together, bring awareness, discourse, and context. And also the piece right now, for example, is right in, in uh, Florence uh, and Renaissance Dreams in the beautiful Plaza Strozzi and next to Donatello. So I think it's a really getting exciting that how the contemporary modern and Renaissance era can interact with each other in architectural context as well. And Rumi Dreams, another experiment. And as we all know, OpenAI uh, created this incredible new AI tool, DALI2. And I was very fortunate to receive uh, an invitation way before the public release. And as a studio, we were able to this year explore Rumi, Zaha Hadid Architects, 
uh, Gaudi and Mozart. And this year we look at this incredible information of heroes of humanity and try to understand their life. But one of the projects that I think will take a significant reaction was it, it, in last month in Barcelona, we were able to take the entire facade of Gaudi's Casabatio, which received 47,000 people in the form of a AI data performance in the city of Barcelona. So as Gaudi says, originality consists in returning to origin, does that which is original returns to the simplicity of the first solutions. And I thought that is an incredible time to ask the question of living architecture. To me, metaverse is not just another like a boring marketplace or a TV on our face. To me, where the physical and the virtual meaningfully connects. And for this project, we imagine what will happen if we can take the UNESCO heritage facade, by the way, 100 billion points of this incredible facade, 3D scanned by LIDAR for the UNESCO heritage context. And we were able to get this data and transform it into an, a data sculpture. And the piece uses real-time data also from the building. And by using a weather station, the NFT artwork or the data sculpture is real-time getting data from the built environment of Barcelona and transforming the facade, as we see here, in three different like, modules. The wind, the wind patterns and the temperature is creating a behavior inside the artwork. And the, like in the rain or, the, or, or snow or other um, physical phenomena of weather situations, also creating a reaction in real time with the artwork as well. Um, so we have been also the Mega Grand's winner for Epic Games uh, during the Venice Biennale architecture and have been using uh, extensively a very complex ways of uh, Unreal Engine in our uh, research and in practice. And this is a kind of a game, I guess, that is never the uh, same again as well. And then the piece was also uh, had a piece in New York where people can see in New York, in Rockefeller Center, in a three-dimensional way, or people in Barcelona uh, watch the piece in the form of a performing arts. And more than, and more than forty-seven thousand people coming together was an incredibly unique experience. I wish you could see this experience, and it may be one of the most uh, rarest feeling uh, in our journey. And lastly, I would like to show um, our recent and most proud project in collaboration with Patrick Chubakar and Zahadi Architects.
the project started almost a year ago, and thanks to Patrick Schumacher and an amazing meeting at the London office. And it was, I guess, um, DDP, the, the, the beautiful building also in Seoul, was looking for an exhibition that is also like looking for a collaboration between our studio and also Zad Architects. And it was a deep honor because, I mean, they are our heroes as a studio and imagining together was just incredible opportunity. And it was just a perfect timing when we were researching the Zaha archives with Salgen and other like AI research. The OpenAI team was just um, in um, reach out and said that they have this exciting research going on and if you would like to be a part of it. So it was way before DALI 2 was publicly available. And, and with Patrick and, and Zaha Code team, we sit together with these amazing prompting techniques and we created many, 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 like thousands of prompting techniques from this incredibly inspiring DALI 2 research. And then we learned that actually, what was amazing is not only just two dimensional world, but of course Zaha is architect's incredible support, we also 3D model these environments. And I wanna like very quickly show you um, uh, some of our um, exciting research. Um, at the moment, um, the, so the story, at, if you go to like a sale, you will be able to like explore a three dimensional immersive room. I think thanks to Zaha Hadid Architects, it's our best immersive room ever, is you see six general projectors in a, such a small room and a bright and amazingly well done um, geometric interpolations of the space. And when you enter the space, you will be able to go this uh, OpenAI DALI 2's environment 3D modeled, and you can truly um, and go through this, this world. Uh, it's a three chapter piece, explores incredible archives of also um, Zaha archives, their incredible archival photography. And we train also like um, style again on, on an incredibly um, um, remarkably inspiring archive. And then thanks to Patrick, we just, narrowed down many like selections and then transform the immersive room into the uh, canvas. And the second chapter is where we look at this uh, Zaha design studies, interior and exterior independently, and look at the entire collection and try to reconstruct any reality from the, uh, from the archive as well. And at the end, we generate different models of um, uh, generative like uh, AI models, also static forms such as UMAPs and reconstruct them in immersive room environments based on the similarities. And then at the end, um, the world of chapter three, which we call them dreams happen. And Patrick and I have been like deep dive into the uh, model itself and then find some exciting and for from his perspective, very important findings. And then Zaha team 3D model these environments where you can later step in inside. And I think the name architecting the metaverse truly to me should be like this, a profound research through artistic and architectural imagination, excellent like design processes and asking the most important questions. And at the end, I think we achieved this unique project where you can feel and touch the metaverse in three dimensional environments. Here are our some findings. And if you're interested, we will be uploading to our website and you can find some amazing 3D modeled optimized uh, geometries from the Zaha team. And I think that is my 30 minutes right now. And thank you very much. See you in data land. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. That was truly extraordinary. Um, this, this has been an amazing 12 months for you and an amazing 12 months, I would say, for AI and architecture um, with all these books coming out. And I just wanted to thank Refik for the image on the front cover of my, of my book, Architecture of the Age of AI, which is also a Zaha project. I think possibly the first ever generated uh, uh, style can image of architecture hallucinated a truly remarkable thing. And I wish I just wish I'd been in Barcelona for that particular moment. It was something that I missed and uh, maybe we can get you to do something in Shanghai at some point as well, but this is fantastic work. And again, very emblematic of, of the kind of the, what we're trying to do with this open ceremony. Refik comes from Turkey and conquers America and does this amazing thing. And it's, it's uh, maybe I could just ask you one final comment, uh, Refik, to say something in Turkish for our Turkish viewers. Yes. Uh, tekrar herkese merhabalar. Umarım uh, bu Neil'in ve Philip'in başlattığı Digital Futures Umarım hepimize örnek olur. E, Türkçe olarak da tekrar Zeynep teşekkür ediyorum sana. E, hepimiz Hepimizin e, devleri var, ilham aldığı insanlar var. Lütfen etik olarak araştırmaya, kimden neyi öğrendiğimizi paylaşmaya, e, onurla ve gururla söylemeyi unutmayalım. Teşekkürler, sevgiler, selamlar. Teşekkürler.
Thank you, Zainab, and thank, thank you, Refik. Um, so let's move on to, that was wonderful, wonderful. Um, let's move on to, to our next presenter, um, who is uh, going to be uh, Mariana Cabuquera, who is somebody who I think has also had an extraordinary year, extraordinary year in the sense that uh, she's been present everywhere. Um, she's been a lead designer in Zahadid Architects ZHA, and now in the past few days, literally is setting out on our own, um, a really extraordinary thing. I'd like to, in Invite Giovanni, uh, I'd like to, 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 like, uh, in, to invite Angelica Ponsio to say something by way of introduction. I also would like to uh, thank Angelica for helping set up the, um, the whole uh, Portuguese language channel, which has been so significant. Of course, Mariana was the first person to present on the first episode of our Portuguese uh, language channel. So, uh, Angelica, would you like to uh, um, uh, say something by way of introduction? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Neil. Um, bom dia, bom dia para todos. It's with great pleasure that I'm introducing as an emerging designer, Mariana Cabogueira. Mariana is an architect and urban designer from Portugal. She worked five years as a senior architectural designer at Zaha Did Architects, and she's currently working as the head and lead of design for the metaverse company Wider World. Mariana taught at the Architectural Association in London for four years and currently teaches worldwide to lives, workshops, and webinars. Graduated from the School of Architecture in Lisbon and at Politecnico de Milano, she moved to London to explore design and technology through the postgraduate course Design Research Laboratory at the Architectural Association School. Her research interests gravitate around parametric design, generative design, digital design, and the evolution of architecture through the use of technological means such as robotic fabrication. Mariana joined Saha Hadid Architects after graduating from AA School in 2017. She was part of the competition cluster for five years and the designer of winning projects such as Navi Mumbai Airport, Western Sydney Airport, Exhibition Center Beijing, uh, the competition and competition Tower C in Shenzhen. Currently, Mariana jumped to the challenge of designing the metaverse, joining wider, wider world as the head and lead of the meta future era. In Portuguese, uh, é com grande prazer que apresento como emerging designer Mariana Cabogueira. Mariana é arquiteta urbanista portuguesa, trabalhou cinco anos como senior designer dos Zaha Hadid Architects. Atualmente, ela trabalha como chefe e líder de design da empresa Metaverse Wider World. Mariana lecionou na EA em Londres por quatro anos e atualmente ministra workshops e webinars ao vivo para uma audiência internacional. Formada pela Escola de Arquitetura de Lisboa e pelo Politécnico de Milão, ela se mudou para Londres para explorar design e tecnologia, tendo frequentado o Design Research Laboratory da Architectural Association School, EA. Seus interesses de pesquisa gravitam em torno do design parametrico, design generativo, design digital, fabricação robótica. Uh, Bem-vinda, uh, Mariana. Um prazer tê-la aqui de novo. Olá, Angélica. Hi, everyone. Uh, super happy to be back uh, once again. And uh, really, thank you, Neil, and, and thank you, Angélica. And um, let's get this started. So I'm very happy that Rafik left on a very similar note where I'm going to pick up from. So I'm going to pick up from Zaha, and I'm going to uh, continue to... Um, doing architecture on the metaverse. It's going to be exactly about that, but outside of that. Uh, so let me just go full screen here. Okay, so exactly like Angelica said, I am Mariana Cabogueira. I worked five years as a senior architectural designer at Zaha Hadid Architects. Uh, I recently um, quit and left the office to start a new journey of design and of architecture in uh, Metaverse, which will be, let's call it Web3. Um, the name Metaverse might disappear very soon, but Web3 is here to stay. So I decided to take the challenge and I'm currently head and lead of design in a future era for a Metaverse company called Wilder World. I've been also um, a teacher for a very long time. I've been taught in schools. I've been taught worldwide uh, through Live Academy, Future Leap, and currently Parametric Architecture with the Meta Studio. So today I'm going to walk you through um, my personal journey, but also the journey that design ha has been having in architecture for the past uh, years. And um, starting from uh, obviously my school years where I was not doing design in architecture back in my country, my hometown, Portugal, and uh, how I was so much driven into design and how there is a whole chapter of design in architecture that we don't address uh, traditionally in schools which is a shame. I had to move countries and look for uh, ways to do design or in architecture. I was in London and then moving to teaching. So kind of spreading my knowledge worldwide 
And then these two different dimensions where I've been uh, working, one in a physical environment at Zara Hadid for five years, competition cluster, and then moving on very recently to um, the virtual environment. So what we call now the metaverse for wilder world. Uh, so let's kind of walk through what uh, design can do in architecture and what we as architects can uh, do with design from one environment to a completely new and different environment. So I'm going to start from the beginning. And um, I was a student in Lisbon. Um, I studied many years. I really don't recommend. It's not the recipe for success. But unfortunately, um, when you're learning things that are not exactly aligned with your skills and with your beliefs, you need to keep looking for new things. You need to keep looking for new educations. And that's what happened to me. So I learned eight years. I was a student for eight years. I was a student in Lisbon. I was a student in Milan. And then um, my final years were finally in, in London at the DRL, so Architectural Association. So when I was a student, like uh, like most of you, like very young, I, I was a, a bit different in Portugal. I was um, a little bit more plastic than usual. It's important to understand that being plastic and believing in form does not mean that it's a whim. It's not uh, something that you do because you can, or it's it's not like something that um, it's something that you do as intuition. And you understand that form also connects buildings, and form also brings dialogues in between time and in between spaces. And I was a true believer in form, and obviously uh, my country is very modern in a way that's still uh, following a lot of modernist ideas. So I was a little bit different, and it took me a long time and a lot of work to make other people understand what I meant with um, the meaning of form and the meaning of plastics. And usually we stop uh, history of architecture on in Le Corbusier, so around the 50s and uh, in the 60s. And then funny enough, what happens from the 70s onwards is actually the revolution of form and the revolution of technology. And we don't learn that enough in school. Um, so basically when I finished my master, my first master, what I had in front of me was the panorama that most of us have. Um, I had unpaid internships in front of me. I had small scales of architecture. I had refurbishment, which personally I have a very big problem with. I'm not in favor of bringing the past to the present and pretending that the past makes sense to the present. Um, and I was young and I truly believed in that. So it was very clear. I was getting all the signs that it was time to move to another country and to find a place where my beliefs made any sense. Uh, that's when I started on my own looking for other, another master, a post-graduation, a PhD, whatever I could to extend my creativity, to extend my beliefs, to have something that also to have the skills to create form, which is something that not everyone teaches you. What are the softwares? How can I do design in architecture? So, and after six years, I couldn't do it, uh, although I understood it. Uh, so I looked for something else and I landed on Architectural Association, a school of architecture in London. I went, it was on my birthday, a very random day um, to go to a school and it was the open day. They were showing all the projects and all the courses they had. And I knew the school because Zaha was a student before there and uh, Rem Kulis and uh, they, she also taught there. Stephen All was also there. So there's this amazing uh, legacy in, in this school. And I thought there's probably something here for me. Funny enough, that was exactly the same day that the DRL presentation, so a course called Design Research Laboratory, um, were being held on this mega auditorium. Everyone was uh, running to this auditorium and I decided to follow them and I saw Patrick Schumacher was there. Zaha is usually a, ju a judge in there. And um, I saw all of these panels with this amazing design, completely out of my league uh, kind of skill. But the most important part was not what I was looking at. It was exactly what was being explained. And for the first time, I felt that everything I believed in for cities and for architecture was a given for these students. They were 10 steps ahead of that. So I felt I was at home and I needed to pick up and and I decided I'm moving to London and I'm going to start this course. And that's exactly what happened. Um, one year and a half later, I will be on that same auditorium and presenting exactly the same kind of boards with completely different uh, design skills I had in Portugal. And uh, it was an interesting journey. So basically, DRL, it's important that everyone knows this. Um, I think that now even Digital Futures, uh, you guys are doing a lot of workshops, but 
uh, seven years ago, it was not that common to find a school that was teaching all of these uh, design uh, softwares because they are design, okay? They aid design. Uh, it's not just computer aiding architecture. The, the softwares actually aid the design in architecture, which is basically what the DRL was. So we learn all of these softwares from scratch, from zero, like an absolute avalanche of softwares for the first six months. And then we have a whole year where you pick a studio. I pick Patrick's studio. You have Sadio's studio, you have Theo's studio, and they all have their own agenda. So Patrick's studio was the studio that was uh, slightly more um, in sync with what I thought that um, made sense for architecture. So you have to have your own theory. In my, in our case, I worked with Nicolas Tornero and Juan Carlos. Uh, in our case, it was exoskeletons. So how can you bring the forces that traditionally inside of a tower are uh, running vertically as columns, like we know? Um, how can you transition to um, a system, a network, a structural network that can be outside of this tower, so it's called exoskeleton, and then allowing and freeing the interior of all towers, uh, column free. So it was obviously a research. This was not the proposal for London, um, but more important, it was the theory that was behind and the software that we were running to prove our theory. When I finished the DRL, um, obviously it comes that critical time that we all had. Uh, where do you go after you finish your? This, in this case, it was my second master your masters and um, I was with Patrick and I mean, there is no shame in saying that Zaha was obviously um, my favorite architect and the architect I related the most, not just for render, uh, gender reasons, but um, Zaha was actually pushing the design to a, an intuitive design that I really believed in. So I spoke with Patrick and Patrick recommended me to um, the competition cluster, I had an interview and I joined uh, what we know as the Z cluster. What is a cluster? Very simple. I'm just going to explain what a cluster is. So in a very big firm, you have departments. And in this case, at Zaha, they call them clusters. Uh, cluster one, cluster two, cluster three. It's like uh, departments to organize the number of employees they have. This cluster in particular was a cluster that was um, gathered by Zaha not a very long time ago. And it was a cluster that has as main and primarily uh, reason um, push the boundaries of design. So as you can imagine in a very big office, not all projects are going to be uh, pushing the design boundaries to its limit. Uh, like the ones you know that are public or the ones that even I know that are public. There are a lot of normal and a bit more standardized uh, projects happening. In this cluster, all the projects need to push the design to a different boundary in architecture. So basically, I came from a country where design is not put in place. It's actually a little bit frowned upon. And, um, and then I started my first professional uh, career at a place where design was one of the most important things to be taken care of. And uh, more important than that, what's the next step of design? And that was my role inside of Zaha for five years. What is very important to share with you and designers is uh, when you're looking at these buildings, usually we try to understand what's the software that is running inside and most of us fail when we are guessing. So I'm just gonna <laughs> unveil this now. The software that is more common between all the buildings um, from Zaha are done and created inside of a software called Maya. Okay, Maya from Autodesk. Maya was a software that Zaha was brought to the Zaha office um, first. And it was a, a very different kind of software. It was used by animators of so Pixar or, or DreamWorks. And then it was brought to architecture to create smooth uh, projects and, and in this case, smooth meshes. Basic principles of Maya, it's not Rhino, it's not 3ds Max. It does relate with 3ds when it comes to working in face edge and vertex mode, okay? But most important, what's so important critical and what is so um, specific about Maya is an algorithm that is running inside that is called Maya Katmu Park. Um, Rhino is trying to catch up, still very far from that. The 3ds Max also is trying to put some Maya Katmu Park, some Katmu Park subdivision uh, in, it's still not getting there. Maya is absolutely excellent when it comes to smooth surfaces and to the algorithm that is running. Traditionally, the question that everyone asks me is, how do you start? How do you start a building? So my job at Zaha was to create as many buildings, as many options as you can imagine for a specific brief. And the question, how do I start, is the question that we all have whenever we open a clean software or we have a clean sheet of paper. Uh, what's my first move? And uh, obviously, in architecture, it comes most common from a sketch. 
a sketch that is not artistic, a sketch that is not to be shown, it's irrelevant how the sketch looks. This sketch are meant, is meant to inform your 3D and inform um, your brain on how to start modeling, okay? It's not artistic, uh, it's not illustrative at all. I sketch really quickly and then the software and me go kind of in parallel. So the software start informing my form and I inform the software with my uh, what I want from this building to be. Uh, so when I started, obviously, I realized how important this software was. The software is not very known outside. It's still very much taught in niches. So it was taught at the DRL and um, it is like so, uh, taught inside of, of the office. So we all share the knowledge from each legacy and each generation. So when I realized that and I joined, I was young and I was one of the I was the youngest in the cluster um, in 30 people. I realized that I was by far the worst at this software. And uh, this software was a, as important as having a pen in architecture. So I decided to do my own work outside of uh, office uh, on my weekends uh, after work. I was looking at everyone's uh, uh, workflow, everyone's tricks, and I was doing my own projects, my own exercises. And in a, in a way, I started creating a portfolio of different spaces, different experimentations. They don't have to be architecture. They are pushing for the software and pushing for the design. For that reason, I kind of decided, um, let's go back to the school where I come from, in London, obviously, and um, let's teach Maya properly as a professional because this software is going to be their ticket in. And it also benefits the office, benefits them, benefits the school. So I decided, okay, let's go back and let's teach them everything teach them everything I know on Maya. So I went back to DRL. I taught Maya for two years unofficially, two years officially, so four years in conclusion. Um, my students work absolutely amazing. You can see what the Maya legacy it is inside and they are pushing for the software as well and the, with their own technique, which is absolutely amazing. And then um, it brought me to this current time in the last three years of um, leaving the niche of DRL and starting the uh, teaching worldwide. So spreading the knowledge to everyone that is that are not just in on the DRL or at Zaha, but um, what this software can also do for these people and what these people can do with the software. So I started working, uh, teaching worldwide. Obviously I started with very abstract jobs, very abstract projects. I was teaching the projects I was doing outside of office, obviously, and uh, very simple things. They are not meant for, a direct relation with architecture. They are just design. They are pushing for the software. They are enabling them to understand the software or to use all the tricks and techniques that I can imagine whenever you're doing architecture uh, without having to be the, the most traditional architecture that we know. Also started a lot of collaboration with artists. So mixing Houdini with Maya, uh, with this concert hall with Chantal Matar, also an amazing artist. And at the, same at the same time, teaching both, so Houdini and Maya, how can we um, use both at the same time and one can complement the other one? This took me to, uh, I had so many students and so many people interested that it took me to create a whole package for Maya learners, for designers, for people who want to do design in architecture, and not just the traditional one. And I started doing a whole package of Maya masterclass. So from left to right, beginners, intermediates, and advanced. So everyone can pick up from Maya and finish as professionals and as a, in an advanced level. Also mixing up some of the most important softwares in architecture like Rhino. So Maya and Rhino are, it's a match made in heaven. And uh, if you do Maya, you should do Rhino. If you do Rhino and you like organic design, do Maya. And this was kind of the work that I was doing outside of office and I was doing just for teaching or just for myself as content. So uh, almost for fun only. Um, but they will have a different destiny, which is going to be my second part of this conversation. So that was designed for teaching, designed for content, designed for fun. Um, this part, I'm going to show you what this kind of design and what this kind of technique um, evolve when it comes to real life practice and when it comes to physical uh, environments. So these are some of my favorite uh, competitions than at Zaha, obviously only the ones that I can show. My favorites are actually unpublished yet. so. Uh, maybe I'll never show them, but uh, these are the ones that are public. Uh, Navi Mumbai Airport was probably one of the most important competitions for me. I worked for this uh, project for a year and a half, I think. Sydney Airport was also a very important project. At Zara. Um, it actually taught me that uh, in this office, it's not just about 
uh, doing form, and it's not just about um, creativity and form for the sake of form. Actually, there is this respect for uh, elegancy and respect for simplicity. And it was a, a lesson that I learned at Saha with this project, honestly. And then um, another project that I did in Beijing, the exhibition for Beijing uh, on your right. And uh, it was a very cool project because basically I was, I joined very late and all of my friends were modeling the project and were developing it. So it was an honor for me to continue their own legacy and uh, for construction as well. Okay, now I'm ending with um, the most important competition for me and, uh, and now to completion. Um, I did the competition for a tower in Shenzhen. The brief was twin towers, 400 meters high. Um, we were competing against SOM, uh, I think Foster's UN studio and um, a repertoire, absolutely overwhelming repertoire of, of, of offices. And um, basically we started as three designers or four designers. I knew them pretty well, we were very close. And this little site had a thousand of different towers that you can imagine. So I, we rendered a thousand of different options. And then at some point, uh, I decided to connect the Twin Towers instead of having them separate. And then my project leader did this, did this great idea of opening up a wing uh, that brings all of this green through terraces, uh, eight floors of terraces up the tower. And that's when Tower C was born. Um, after that, the, the, the group started to get super big and the team was huge. And um, four months later, we found out that we were neck and neck with UN Studio. Funny enough, one of my friends was doing towers, uh, the, the Tower C for UN Studio, and in the end, Zaha won. So after Zaha won, um, the office challenged me to stay on the project until completion, so to be on the later stages until detailed design. And um, that's exactly what I've been doing at Zaha for the past two years. I took the competition project and um, basically stayed on this levels on the podium so the public levels with a very great team for um, the podium team and we took it to detail design with all of the, these consultants and uh, loads of Chinese consultants and two years of a, a lot of hard work so Tower C was um, my ticket out of Zaha it was um, when I started the uh, when I started the, the final stages I I was pretty sure that it was going to be my last project at Zaha, even it was a year and a half. Uh, but there was something else happening outside of Zaha um, that was interesting me quite a lot, which was the dimension of design in the digital era, or let's say in the virtual era. Um, what was what what we call now metaverse, and most important, what is Web three. So that kind of made me realize that all of these thousands of projects that I was doing actually could have a different dimension to them. And maybe there's another set of architecture that takes our design skills as architects uh, on board and they are valued a lot more than the ones that we do in real life. Obviously, I'm gonna run through the very basic principles of what Metaverse is, so we are on the same page, okay? I'm not gonna be boring, I'm gonna do this very fast. Um, basically, NFTs, we all know, right? Refik was talking about them, and uh, we know that they are units of digital data. They are 2Ds, uh, hopefully they will become more 3D, but mostly 2Ds, okay? So the NFT revolution started, let's say, revolution a year ago, uh, along with uh, the revolution of cryptos. And then along with the, with NFTs, everyone started questioning, especially architects and um, texting me quite a lot, asking, what does this mean for architecture? Um, do you think we're gonna have a space uh, inside of this? And that's when uh, Meta uh, announced a digital space where NFTs are. And um, basically what could be a second fabric to society, which is for us architects, an amazing <laughs> playground almost. So second fabric to society. All of this happens inside of one, let's say, mega world, which is called the World Wide Web. Okay, World Wide Web, we have been on the World Wide Web for two for all of this time. And now we are moving to World Wide Web three, where there is the second fabric of society called the metaverse. Probably will be called something else in 50 years. Probably in 100, they will look at us and laugh because we were saying metaverse, but World Wide Web three is here and it's gonna stay. Simple. Inside of the World Wide Web, we have the NFTs. They, we let you, let's say as an architect, there are plots like normal building plots. And then we have the whole metaverse that gathers them in a single fabric. Let's say digital fabric. 
So um, when I heard about Metaverse, the first thing that I knew about uh, other offices engaging with Metaverse was obviously, was obviously Zaha because I was there. Um, they were developing Liberlands and they were developing a very interesting concept for architects. That is not just because I know that we are still very uh, skeptical about this, about jumping into a full uh, virtual reality. Um, so what gives us a little bit more, what makes it a, bit, a little bit more settling is this term called mixed realities. So in mixed realities, um, yes, you do embrace the metaverse, you do embrace the virtual reality and experiencing spaces in a virtual world, but the buildings you create still have a mean to be built somewhere. Okay, in this case for Zaha, it was Czech Republic uh, with Liberland. They were doing metaverse, but at the same time, you can tell by the by the building's typology that it can be buildable and most likely uh, it will. What is the metaverse right now for all of us? Um, number one metaverse, let's say, Decentraland and Sandbox. I don't know how you feel about this, but as an architect and especially as a designer in architecture, I feel um, extremely insulted. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think this is bad design. Uh, this was done by game designers, but as an architect, when you feel that you have all of this freedom and you have new set of rules, and when you see that uh, they are not taking advantage of it, and um, you have been struggling all, all of these years to take a column out and to kind of avoid these small windows and avoid the, the doors. And uh, when you see that when someone has a chance to abolish them, they don't do it, you kind of uh, suffer a little bit. And that was one of the reasons why um, I felt like I had the responsibility as a designer to bring what the next generation of space is. Obviously, I was not the only one thinking about this. I think we all, uh, designers thought about it and then we had all of these small companies launching on their own doing their own experiments of design like Refit, for example spaces or voxel architects they are trying to implement design and break the boundaries and to be an architect inside of this space and not to give it just to game designers okay also be archangels a little bit shy but be archangels doing a very interesting job on understanding what's the typology, what happens to architecture typologies, uh, the, the typologies that we know for so many years, what are they when we take this set of rules and we implement new ones. And um, I was at Zaha this time when I was researching all of this and I started looking back at my projects and all of this experience and all of this effort that was do done outside of work and uh, I realized that maybe there is actually a future for them and there's a possibility for this kind of architecture to be experienced and not to be just a render. Um, so and it was a very big opportunity to bring this new software that Maya, not new, uh, to bring this software that is Maya to a new reality and to, to break the boundaries of design in a new space as well, that is not just the real space, not the physical space. And that's when I was reached out by a Metaverse company called Wilder World. It's a Canadian company. 150 people work inside of Wilder World and they contacted me to be the head and the lead architect of one of the worlds that they are building and um, to have a studio, to have a group of people that are working as architects in the uh, digital space. What happens inside of these kind of companies? Usually you have um, the game developers, let's say as architects, we understand them as the engineers. Uh, so they are the ones with the rules, they are the ones that know how much a server can take, and uh, they are the ones kind of, um, let's say, constraining the design that you do. Um, traditionally, like the engineers or the consultants, and then you have the designers, uh, which is us, the architects. You, you can do the Blender, you can do Rhino, you can do even SketchUp. Uh, Houdini is very famous for Metaverse and Maya, which is what I want to bring. So for Wild World, the first project is very simple. Okay, it's going to be uh, basically the area of Miami. So the same footprint that Miami has, as in plot foot footprint. Each plot equals an NFT. Each plot will have a building. Each plot will have a purpose, a function, exactly like we have in normal cities. But it makes you wonder and question: What is the function? What does it mean? And um, what's the kind of what's the program in here? What's the activity in here? What's what's the interaction with the other people is in here? So you kind of start questioning the typologies in architecture, but at the same time making sure, and this is super important, that um, you bring memory of space into this digital era. Because if architects don't do it, no one's gonna do it. So think about what's your memory, what connects you to the physical space? How can I bring this to the digital area? 
And um, because of all of this, I also decided that um, I think architects and designers exactly like in real life. Uh, we, we know how to design, we know how to do our plans, but we also know a little bit of engineer, we know a little bit of MEP, we know a little bit of everything, and that informs our design. And for that reason, I decided to start the studio with parametric architecture for metaverse in specific, where I'm teaching Maya, okay, so our design tool, but I'm also teaching the uh, engineering part, the Unreal, the game development part. So one informs the other exactly like the real life. Okay, so you know exactly how it works, how the game works, what's the engineering behind, you know how to do it, and then that will inform your design. And basically, that's exactly where I'm at. Okay, this is one of my latest projects that I'm fingers crossing to have experiencing it in one way or the other one. But um, I do believe that most of the offices will run these two different worlds. Okay, so one that is virtual world and another world that is the real world, and one will inform the other one. Uh, I understand that it's hard for architects to take this in the beginning, but you have to think that now is the time for the foundations of what, what Web3 is. So foundations are being done now. In 100 years, this will mean nothing. This will be completely different, but you will be 10 steps ahead of this. And you have to question yourself if you want to be on the foundation, if you want to create a set of rules for design in this space, if you want game designers to be responsible for this, or if us as architects are again in charge of the next generation of space, which I truly believe that we are. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Mariana. Oh, oh, obrigada. Uh, maybe, sorry, <laughs> um, Mariana, can I just say, ask you to say just a few words in Portuguese to our Portuguese audience? Sim, claro que sim. Uh, portanto, olá a toda a gente que é português. É um prazer enorme estar a falar com vocês. Acho que um, se vocês sentirem alguma coisa que eu fiz, faz sentido para vocês. Uh, e se for preciso sair do país, sai do país, não se trata de fronteiras para isso, se trata do mundo inteiro, de, de um conhecimento coletivo e qualquer coisa que vocês precisem, contactem-me pessoalmente, eu respondo a tudo o que é português. Obrigada, Mariana. E brasileiro. Obrigada. Uh, Mariana, obrigada, Angélica. Uh, just to say thank you, Angélica, again, for uh, setting up this um, amazing uh, Portuguese language uh, um, channel, which is straddling Brazil, your country, and Mariana's country, Portugal, and other Portuguese-speaking uh, 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 countries. So, uh, Mariana was an amazing, so much energy. It was, it was so great to see, um, and you're an inspiration, I think, to the to the emerging generation, just as Zaha was an inspiration to you. And it's so important to have these female voices that are so powerful and really changing our discipline in the way that Zaha herself did so, uh, not so long ago. Um, we're going to move on now to our, uh, our, our third presentation, also an emerging designer. Um, uh, and we have uh, uh, Benaz Farahi, originally from Iran. Um, and she, like Refik, uh, came to Los Angeles and then uh, established herself, established her practice. Um, and uh, what is, makes her work stand out in particular, I think, is the way in which there is a, a very strong theoretical edge to it, a very strong critical edge, um, especially addressing the question about feminism. Um, so it's wonderful to have Benaz here, and I would like to invite uh, Mohamed Beju, who is also someone who deserves many thanks, not only just for, for the, for, for the um, uh, setting up our new website that uh, looks beautiful and will be working fully properly soon, um, but also uh, for, for setting up the Farsi language channel. Again, one of the important initiatives over the last 12 months. So um, I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, Mohamed Beju to say a few words in English and Farsi uh, to introduce uh, Benaz Farai. We can't hear you, Mohammed. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Neil. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Digital Future Summer Event Opening Ceremony. I'm Mohammed Beju. I'm the manager of the Farsi channel of Digital Futures. I will introduce Benaz Farahi, one of the keynote speakers today. It's a great pleasure to introduce such a fantastic art, architect and designer. So as we know, Ben Asfrahi is a designer, creative technologist and critical maker trained as, a, as an architect. And she explores how to foster an emphatic relationship between the human body and the space around it through the implementation of emerging te technologies. Um, 
So uh, her goal is to enhance the interaction between human beings and the built environment by following morphological and behavioral principles in, inspired by natural systems. Uh, Benas has worked with leading firms such as Adidas, Autodesk, Focus Studios, uh, and so on. And she, has, uh, she also collaborated with Professor Bero Koshnevis on two NASA-funded research projects developing a, a robotic fabrication technology to 3D print structures on the moon and Mars. And she has been an artist in residence at Autodesk Pier 9. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. She has received her, her PhD in interdisciplinary media arts and practice at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. She also holds a bachelor and two master's degrees in architecture. And currently, she is an assistant professor at the Department of Design, California State University, Long Beach. Uh, so I'm going to speak Farsi. Salam be hame. Khali khushu madin be digital features Farsi. Amruzi iftekhar darim ke dar yek az sohanona amruz khanum behnas farahi bashan. Va man ye mukhtasar muarefi mi koam ke achad niyazi be muarefi ishoni shamat o khub mishnasi neshon. و جلسه قبل از ورکشاپ های فارسی هم ما در خدمتشون بودیم با جناب آقای فرشاد فرهی خیلی جلسه جالبی بود میتونین برین تو یوتیوب ببینینش تو کانال ما خانم فرهی معمار رو طراح مقیم لس آنجلس ایالات متحده هستن که با طراحی تعاملی که داشتن تونستن بین معماری و تکنولوژی و صنعت مد تلفیق ایجاد کنند به ناز بعد از گذروندن دوره فوق لیسانس معماری دکترای خودش رو تو رشته میدیا آرت تو دانشگاه یو اس سی گرفته و در حال حاضر ایشون به عنوان استاد تو دانشگاه کالیفرنیا استیت لانگ بیچ دارن فعالیت میکنن و معمولا کارهای ایشون به ارتباط بین انسان و محیط ساخته شده پیرامونش ربط داره که حالا به عقیده خود ایشون برقراری این ارتباط میتونه با استفاده از تکنولوژی های جدیدی مثل روباتیک و هوش مصنوعی باشه خانم فرهی جایزه های متعددی بردن که من اصلا بخوام همش رو بگم خودش کلی طول میکشه من به تعدادش بسنده میکنم مثل جایزه طراحی دیجیتال موزه طراحی کوپر هوید و جایزه طراحی اینوویشن بای دیزاین فست کامپنی و ایشون تو مجلات معتبر و سایت های خیلی معتبری مثل وایرد، بی بی سی، سی این این کاراشون قرار گرفته راجبه شما کلی حرف زده شده یک تو گاردین، تو فریم مگزین ایشون ویراستار بودن، مقاله نوشتن، مطلب نوشتن و یکی از ویراستار های کتاب 3D Printed Body Architecture بودن که با جناب نیلیچ فکرم نوشتنش و خیلی خوشحالیم در خدمتشون هستیم بفرمایید به ناز جان در خدمت شما هستیم Thank you, thank you Mohammed uh, for the great thank introduction. Uh, thank you um, to Digital Futures. Um, it's so wonderful to see how Digital Futures have evolved in the last few years. And I have to say, I'm extremely excited about Language Channel as someone from Iran. It's extremely exciting to see um, different language from all around the world and different channels are starting to pick up um, in uh, different countries. So it's very, very exciting. Uh, with that, um, I have a presentation which I'm going to share. It's 18 minutes, actually 20 minutes uh, video. So I'm going to speak over it. Um, let's see how it goes. Uh, let me make sure I share the sound. As computational devices um, are populating um, our lives, and as someone who is really fascinated with tactility, texture, and movements of materials, I'm really interested in developing um, interactive environments um, and explore the range of um, interactive spaces 
ranging from intimate scales and the world of fashion and uh, fashion and wearables, all the way to larger scale and the world of interactive architectures. I'm really interested to develop um, environments uh, or, or spaces that they're active, that they're dynamic, that they're shape changing, and they interactive in an intuitive way with the users. I'm also, um, in the last few years, I've been really interested in the concept of um, uh, critical computations. I'm really fascinated how um, computational systems uh, could be used in order to address larger critical issues uh, of human existence, such as emotion, feminism, uh, perceptions. Um, and in this, present, in this presentation specifically, I'm going to um, address the notion of critical computations, gaze, and surveillance through my own uh, practice. As some of you are already familiar with my practice in my work, I combine a lot of uh, new emerging technologies of computer vision, facial tracking, gaze tracking, um, and, uh, age tracking, various ways that we can understand physiological responses of the users. Um, this also includes brain computer interface um, and uh, various type of uh, sort of uh, biometric sensors. So my hope is really to see how we can use these technologies as a way that we can um, challenge the, the power, structure, power structures and see the gaze as a form of resistance strategies. So, um, and, and through this argument that through this presentation that I'm presenting today, I'm going to show also a series of projects that I have developed in the last few years. For instance, this emotive um, soft robotic wearable is equipped with a small um, camera that responds to the people around with various um, type of behaviors. This type of smart soft robotic wearables, for instance, could potentially help those people that they have difficulties recognizing facial expressions of the people around and help them to integrate um, in a better way with their social settings. Um, iridescence, which is this um, emotive color equipped with facial tracking camera and array of moving quills. Um, uh, basically, it responds to the movements of the people around and the facial expression, ex expressions they're expressing through their facial expressions. So similar to how a blind person uh, could sense through haptic information, if your eyes are closed or if you're blind, uh, through the haptic uh, uh, pressure, um, you would understand where people are standing and what kind of facial express expressions they're expressing um, through the sounds and movements of your wearable. Here in this presentation, I really hope to be able to dive deeper into the notion of the gaze and through critical and feminist perspective. Specifically, I want to see what does it mean to be observed? And secondly, um, what do we see when we look out in the world? And um, this would obviously take us to the historical concept of Panopticon. Panopticon refers to an um, institutional building or a system of control um, envisioned by English philosopher Jeremy Bentham in 18th century, which is really about how allows the guard to observe occupants without them knowing whether they're watched or not. I mean, later this concept was um, sort of revitalized by French philosopher Foucault in his book, Discipline and, Fun uh, Discipline and, and, and um, Punish, 
where he really sort of argued that as such a model could be applied in uh, society as a way of controlling um, um, the, the, their citizens in a similar way that if you're the prisoners, you're not knowing whether you're watched or not, um, you could use such a system in order to control um, your, uh, your citizens. I think personally, what is really, really fascinating for me is that rather than sort of external action, the gaze of the watcher is internalized to such an extent that each prisoner become their own watch persons. And if you think about it in the society, and um, this would sort of allow certain rules and regulations to be internalized and to inform our um, actions um, and behaviors and, and even our beliefs. And this way that we sort of internalize and naturalize rules, um, someone can claim that can cause societies to less willing to ch change any sort of unjust um, rules or uh, laws and basically accept them as sort of dominant outlook. So similar to how we don't know whether we are watched or not, we are also not aware that when we are gazing out to the world, what kind of biases we have, what kind of dominant outlooks are rooted in our um, way of looking at the world. This sort of internalized male gaze, or uh, sorry, uh, internalized um, uh, power structure is can be seen in the work of Laura Mulvey, Visual Pleasure and Narrative uh, Cinema where she argues that the female body um, uh, is represented in the cinema mainly for pleasure of the male viewers. And um, I'm sure in the audience, the women, especially from non-Western country, uh, you experience as you're regularly subject to sexual harassment as you're entering into the public space, uh, women are usually sub subjects of um, a sort of this sort of sexual harassment and, and various forms of looked atness. But for me personally, the question that came about is that is it possible for women to subvert this through the power of their gaze? Um, could we use new emerging technologies such as computer vision to allow women to know whether the onlookers are looking or staring at them? So augmented with uh, facial tracking um, and gaze tracking technology, this cape that you're seeing is 3D printed wearable, uh, that it's um, allowing the, the wearer to feel where, uh, which part of their body it's been looked at. So if you're onlooker, you know that your action has been notified. If you're the wearer, the garment moves on your body and you know that which part of your body is being looked at. I wonder, um, I wonder uh, whether we could use um, uh, eyes as the medium for communication or in fact as a resistance strategies. This is something um, that is underlying in my work. By the way, these are um, sort of uh, style again, produce AI generated um, uh, videos that I produce using uh, the machine learning algorithm based on human and animals eyes. This project that you're seeing, um, uh, it, lead, it takes us to the, the projects that I'm going to present, uh, which is inspired by historical um, mask formed by uh, Bandari women in southern part of Iran. Uh, it's been said that these masks were developed during Portuguese rule, uh, colonial rule, as a way of protecting the wearer from the gaze of a slave master looking for attractive women. Masks are obviously really fascinating. Um, they're uh, from either from these beautiful Iranian masks protecting women from patriarchal oppression, 
to masks that we can see in, uh, for instance, the Northwest East Coast Indians to mask worn as a political statement, you could see that masks could take on different um, social, religious, and political roles. And it could offer interesting insights on ways that masks could be used to either conceal or reveal our identities. Personally, when I look at the design of these masks from um, Iran, uh, what is really fascinating, and I mean, they're beautiful, but they also cover the, the entire face except the eyes. So I've been wondering how eyes could be used as a communication tool. I came across an interesting incident in which Jeremy, Admiral medical Jeremy clothing. Denton, um, blinked the and medical chair when I and during his captivity in Vietnam. How do you think about the, this video is actually showing this moment. Well, I don't know what uh, is happening, but uh, whatever the position of my government is, I support it fully. Well, whatever the position of my government is, I believe in it. Yes, sir. I am a member of that government. I mean, obviously the use of the code or signal messages is nothing new. In fact, during this lockdown, women developed signal messages for reporting domestic abuse, um, for instance, in pharmacy or in phone calls uh, for asking for help. Um, and then I think the other aspects of this project for me was the recent Facebook AI lab experiments in which they were trying to, to have two bots to negotiate um, and enter to a conversation or dialogue with one another. Accidentally, they started to um, start repeating words and starting to not making sense to, to the scientists. scientists. Scientists felt uncomfortable then, and then they intervened with the algorithm in order to make sure this is not happening. I think what is really fascinating for me here is that the knowledge is power and inability to understand uh, unnerves those who wish to maintain their authority. The mask that um, uh, they use um, machine learning algorithm, they trained based on a um, seminal article by um, feminist theorist, a guy, Tria Spivak, can the subaltern speak? She asked whether it's possible for the subaltern or um, uh, uh, for the, for the, so for the uh, subaltern to have a voice on their the face of a uh, colonizer. So the algorithm in this mask uses hair seminal article um, and uses Markov chain, which is a machine learning algorithm to produce letters and words um, that uh, uh, it uses probability to produce uh, words and letters. Uh, and these information will be um, transmitted to the, to the opposite mask. So it uses, um, it generates um, uh, letters and, and uh, words and then sentences and then send them to the opposite mask using BLE, uh, which is a Bluetooth protocol for communication between the mask. Each mask also has a very small um, approximately sensor that tracks the movement and openness of the, the eye and send these um, uh, messages um, to the opposite masks using Morse code. In the video documentation that will be shown in a, in a few seconds, uh, you will see two women wearing this mask and they communicate um, transmitting secret messages between one another. The aim is to really sow anxiety between patriarchal structures and uh, empowering um, these women to have their own uh, sort of language of communication.
the last project that I'm going to share today is the project that I did four months ago for the um, uh, collaboration with um, and commission by a fashion brand called Anna Kiki for the Milan Fashion Week uh, in, in, in Milan, Italy. Um, obviously, this was really interesting, fantastic uh, context to showcase my work, um, especially because fashion is an important medium for production of culture. Yet fashion is, uh, has a long complicit um, between the tradition of female objectification and sexual harassment. Women's body are regularly object objectified um, and um, women usually absorb this as a form of internalized male gaze. So the question for me here was like, what if women were to subvert this through the power of their gaze? How technology could help them to return their gaze? So when I was approached by Anna Kiki for this installation, I was really fascinated to see that to produce this sort of cyborgian future where the, the body of the, the, the model could be extended to external objects, in this case, uh, four robotic arms with four larger scale monitors that um, stream and share the, the, the movements of the wearer or the model's uh, gaze or eyes. Um, but maybe I can also talk about some of the sort of technical challenges or, or the behind the process uh, of this project. This project for the movements of the robots, for the programming of the movement, we used um, uh, tracking of uh, the hands of the, 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 the movements using VR headsets. Um, the, 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 the wearer or the model would wear a helmet that uh, holds two small cameras. Um, the cameras track the, the eye of the wearer and project them into the four, uh, stream them into the four monitors. So this was a really fascinating um, fast track project. Uh, it was collaboration with Universal Robots. Uh, and one of the challenges of, like technical challenges of this project was also uh, controlling multiple robots, um, synchronizations of their behaviors, their movements, to make sure that they sometimes mirror each other, sometimes they're exactly following the same paths. Um, and really to create this sort of anthropomorphic um, uh, behaviors in these robots and give them the illusion that they're staring back um, and expanding the gaze of the, the model back to the audience and make them feel a little um, aware or uncomfortable or uncanny feeling that can produce in the audience uh, if um, they were uh, about to return the gaze. These uh, are showing um, right after the show when people um, came and, and the, there was this interesting moments of the observer looking back at the, the, the observed. Uh, that was really fascinating. And maybe to wrap up um, this presentation, I have to say that um, I think may, many people might not realize, but we are already cyborgs. We are cyborgs because of the relationship that we have with our devices, with our, with our computational systems. As a designer, I'm extremely excited about possibilities that computational systems could bring for us. I think um, uh, in further developing this sort of cyborgian future, I think the questions that we should ask is, what kind of critical questions um, we are interested to address and how we could see that technology could empower, especially those that they face um, injustice uh, or discriminations and how we could see emerging new technologies as a way that empower um, those rather than um, just creating um, anonymous um, a cyborgian future. With that, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. 
Maybe you could just say just a few words in Farsi, um, Benaz. Sorry. To... Oh, sure. Um... مرسی از همگی برای حضورتون من فکر می کنم که این دیجیتال فیوچر خیلی فرصت خیلی عالی هستش برای شما در ایران چون من خودم وقتی در ایران بودم دسترسی به زبان انگلیسی برای من و اینکه ببینم نالج در واقع و دانش در محیط غرب داره چه جوری یاد داده میشه خیلی مهم بود ولی الان برای شما این فرصت وجود داره که به صورت رایگان بتونید از اطلاعاتی که در واقع در غرب وجود داره خیلی راحت استفاده بکنید بنابراین فرصت بسیار عالی هستش که دیجیتال فیچر رو دنبال بکنید مخصوصا بخش فارسیش رو و سعی کنید بخشی از این کامیونیتی باشید یعنی این چیزی هستش که ما میتونیم به کمک همدیگه حتی رشد بیشتری بدیم موفق باشین Thank you Venus. Thank you for the great presentation. Merci, Benaz. Merci, merci, uh, Mohammed. And thank you again for all this hard work you put into the website. Uh, uh, Benaz, that was a wonderful way to follow up uh, Marianne. There's so much energy, so much. Uh, you two are, are incredible icons, I think, for the for uh, art of, uh, female students today. This is what you can achieve. You can come from Iran, you can come from Portugal and to an English-speaking country and take over and launch your career. So congratulations. Um, We now move on. Merci, merci. We now move on to the um, uh, to the uh, one of the most important things of the evening, the uh, the, the the Mark Cousins uh, Theory Award. Um, Sanford is uh, is having technical problems. Um, I think he might have we might have lost him on the on the Zoom, but I'm, I he sent me the the text to read out. So I'm going to read out something before inviting Giovanna to say something by way of. Um, uh, of introduction to, to our, our award winner, Anna Maria Duran Callista. So this is the text that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that uh, Sanford has given me. Um, uh, it's for the Mark Cousins Theory Award. And just to, for those of you who don't know, Mark Cousins uh, has been an incredible um, uh, kind of promoter and, uh, of, uh, of theory. He was teaching at the AA for many years. He was a kind of legend within the AA. Um, And every Friday, I remember going to many of these sessions, uh, the AA would open up and become completely available for free for people to come and listen to, to watch him. And these mesmerizing lectures that which, are, which, which attracted people from all over London. So he was an incredible icon, not necessarily so technical in his outlook and certainly not so interested in computation, but nonetheless interested in issues and, and addressing deeply political issues. Um, so I want to just, just read out uh, the comment that, that Sanford has, uh, has made. Of course, Sanford himself is an icon as well um, within the world of theory. I think that um, uh, 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 he's um, uh, he has led the way and taught in many of the leading institutions and is, I think, the without doubt, the, the, the leading theorist in the world today. Um, and it's great that we, last year we had him on the doctoral consortium session that I hosted. Um, so anyway, let me just read out uh, his, his comment. It is our pleasure to present the second annual Mark Cousins Theory Prize to Anne-Maria Duran Callisto. Maybe I should say what R means. That's the, 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 um, the, the, the awards committee that's consisted of Sanford himself, Alexander Jaisk, who uh, is right now um, in Quito, I think, um, uh, um, Mariana Rodriguez of Des Neves um, and uh, Victoria Barbo. Um, so, um, okay, so here we go. Um, in the cosmopolitan heterodox spirit of Mark Cousins' writing and teaching, primarily the Architectural Association in London, this prize seeks both to expand the scope and style of theoretical practice, as well as to encourage emerging voices to venture more boldly into the often intimidating realms of conventional thought leadership. The prize also seeks to identify and affirm fresh objects of concern, particularly ones arguably urgent, but not yet, yet customarily within the, the narrow purview of traditional design thought and practice. Anna Maria Duran's uh, work can be seen to fit clearly within the tradition beginning from Alexander von Humboldt, whose painstaking documentations and measurements specifically of South American geography revealed more fully than ever before the internal structure and system, system, uh, systematics of natural forms, and especially the system of relationships that sustain them. It is specifically the turning of, of primary attention to the relationships that account for the capacities and performances of our world rather than simply the forms that we believe constitutes one of the, one of the urgent virtues of her work. Duran employs the term socio-natural web, effectively marrying social and anthropological determinations with the natural or life system in which they are embedded. 
we hold this precept to be among the foundational requirements of contemporary ontological thought, the project to realize what might be termed an ontoecology. Durand's work increasingly targets what in, the, in a prior era, most notably in the work of Michel Foucault, and this chimes with Benaz's presentation, was termed systems of thought. Although with the singular expansion from its limited European epistemes to now address vastly broader aspects of human experience and world making, principally the knowledge systems and practices of those we refer to as indigenous cultures. Durand's work with Amazonian epistemologies is in no ways an exoticism, but rather a corrective model for ecological research and understanding, one in which the structure of mind and the structure of the physical world remain in a continual state of mutual generation and elaboration. The dynamism inherent in this perennial interchange and the inclusive quality of the fundamentally undivided reality that it presupposes have been largely absent from design thought and practice for which an entirely new avenue of theoretical approach has become necessary. In one particular excursion in her essays on the, on the, the, the Quichua uh, onto uh, uh, ecology, Duran invokes the infinite entanglement of bird cultures and human linguistic ones that create a dense matrix in which ancestral and, and practical knowledge are embedded, not only in each physical component of the environment, every contact element in the bird's universe, but in the, also in the mesh of meanings endlessly activated by human language and social interactions. Here, the physical world uh, is the knowledge system. Um, and I would stress that. In the pantheist uh, spirit of the French historian, Jules Michelet, whose work on the, national, the natural history of the bird treated the bird's nest as an integral to, to its uh, organismal unity, we wish to continue to affirm with this year's award, uh, last year, um, as with last year's, the importance of directing our theoretical attentions to the powerful shaping forces that still lie outside our routine horizon of concerns. What a powerful speech. Thank you, Sanford, for that. Um, uh, and unfortunately, it was a shame that we weren't able to read it out yourself, but thank you for your contribution. And thank you also to the other members of the jury who painstakingly went through this and I think unanimously, unanimously decided that and Anne Maria Jan Calisco should be the award winner. I just want to invite now, um, again, in the spirit of our diversity, inclusiveness, um, and our language managers, I'd like to invite uh, jo uh, Giovanna Pelaka to say a few words by uh, of introduction to uh, Anna Maria herself. Um, Giovanna. Sure. Uh, thanks, Nick. Well, Ana Maria Duran Calisto is an Ecuadorian architect, environmental planner, and a scholar. Uh, she currently teaches at Yale School of Architecture while also finishing her PhD dissertation on the history of urbanization in Amazonia at UCLA. She is a member of the science panel of the Amazon and has served as academic advisor to the Equatorian government. In 2010, she received a Loeb Fellowship in Advanced Environmental Studies from Harvard GSD. Ana Maria has also taught at PUCE, UCLA, Columbia, University of Michigan, and UC Temuco, and IAC. She co-founded the award-winning design firm studio AO or A0 in 2002 with her husband, uh, Haskran, just seen Calirai in Quito, Ecuador, and has co-edited the books Beyond Petropolis, Designing a Practical Utopia in Nueva Loja, and Urbanism Ecology in America Latina. Now I will present in Spanish. Ana Maria Duran Calisto es una arquitecta planificadora ambiental y académica ecuatoriana. Actualmente enseña en la Escuela de Arquitectura de Yale, mientras también termina su tesis doctoral sobre la historia de la urbanización en la Amazonía en UCLA. Es miembro del panel científico para la Amazonía y se ha desempeñado como asesora académica del gobierno ecuatoriano. En el 2010 recibió una beca LUEB en Estudios Ambientales Avanzados de Harvard GSD 
Ana María también ha enseñado en PUSE, UCLA, Columbia, Universidad de Michigan, en la Universidad de Temuco y en el IAT. Cofundó la firma de diseño ganadora de premios Estudio A0 en el 2002 con su esposo Jaska eh, Singh Kaliray en Quito, Ecuador. Y ha coeditado los libros Beyond Petropolis, Designing a Practical Utopia en Nueva Loja y Urbanismo Ecológico en Latinoamérica. Bienvenida, Ana María. We can hear you, Ana María. You're on mute, Ana. ¿Me escuchan ahora? Sí. Ya. Perfecto. ¿Ya te... no, no me dejaba el sistema, no sé por qué no me dejaba eh, hacer el unmute. <laughs> hacer el unmute. Eh, anyway, I'll switch to English, otherwise I'm going to be confusing right now with this, with this mesh of, of, of languages. Eh, I wanted to, well, first of all, thank, thank you, Neil, and thank you to all the jurors of this wonderful Uh, am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Okay, I got another sign there. And the text by Sanford is absolutely mind-boggling. I absolutely love it. So thank you so much for that text, Sanford. And um, I must say that when I received the message from Neil, I guess this has to do with identity. I had never seen myself as a theorist. I have always considered myself a very pragmatic person facing extremely complex issues in my country. And uh, my ultimate purpose has always been to find very pragmatic solutions to the extremely complex problems. And I know that's a very simplistic way of looking at it because not everything should be understood in terms of, of problem solving and some sort of an engineering mentality towards uh, the, the conditions that we're facing right now at a global scale. But I would like to talk about my, uh, my tiny country for a minute today, because I was thinking this morning, I never get prepared for this type of intimate conversation that we can have on Zoom, and I'd rather just be spontaneous about it. And this morning, what came to my mind, to be honest with you, was uh, Darwin. Uh, I was thinking about the Galapagos Islands. I'm going there on the 15th of July even though my country right now is under some sort of a civil war, um, under brutal repression of the indigenous movement, which has come out to the city to protest once again. And, um, and the reason why I started thinking about the Galapagos and Darwin was because I was wondering what has taken me in the direction that I have followed since I was very young uh, with a detour caused by the architecture school, and I call it a detour because I studied at UPenn in the 90s, at the end of the 90s, um, and UPenn was into computing, still is, and I learned a lot about parametrics back then, and we were all learning about algorithms and how to write programs and how to program space and generate space and form through basically a um, mathematics and a mathematical way of thinking about uh, geometry and structure and spatial relationships. But then going back to Ecuador sort of reminded me why I had pursued architecture in the first place. And it was really not about computing, even though I think our computing offers a great tool at very many levels to tackle the issues that I was really concerned about, which was on the one hand, the favela explosion in the global south, you know, this planet of slums um, as as uh, as Davis called it, and uh, on the other hand, the eco side, the epistemic side, and the genocide that was being perpetrated systematically in my country, but not just in my country, in the whole of South America, and arguably in very many parts of the global South, within these world systems, as discussed by Wallerstein, that very clearly uh, demonstrates the, the relationships that have been established at a global scale since the colonization that started in 1492 with the, the Europeans bumping into the Americas has created a very unequal 
world in which um, our fate is basically to be the site of extractivism, the, the mine, the fossil fuel field. Not that there is an extraction in the north. I was recently in Norway, fascinated by that country. My goodness, very interesting culture, very interesting people. Norway leaves mainly of, from extracting oil in, in the ocean. And uh, it has managed to reinvest most of the profits in some sort of a hybrid of a socialist and a free economy system that I found fascinating. And they have managed to reinvest it in a social really enterprise. And the Norwegians live well. And Norwegians, I have to say, are one of the most interesting cultures I've encountered in my life, uh, exemplary. And I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, those differences. Why is it that extractivism has led to what we call development in the global north, but it has led to the conditions that we face in the global south, which have to do with zero investment or very little investment and simply immense disenfranchisement of uh, millions, billions of human beings. And the reason why I thought about Darwin was because I was wondering about the relationships between place, territory, and what you could call intelligence, collective intelligence, individual intelligence. And I feel that I am just a child of my territory. If I cross a section across my, my small country, which was within the colonial world, was part of the Peruvian Vice Royalty at some point, and then of the Nueva Granada, or more like the Colombian side of the equation at another, and has always been shifting between this Northern Caribbean identity and this Southern deeply Andean identity, and we're sort of like right there at the equator in the middle. And Ecuador is such a colonial name for a country, isn't it? Ecuador, what is that? You know, it's a celebration of this, of this 18th century line, 18th century line for like on the Mine and for the French geodesic mission that came to my country to triangulate the territory and figure out whether the world was squashed at the poles or at the sides and 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 settle the debate between the English and the French and figure out that yeah, it was definitely you know, it, it, it squashed at the pole, so to speak, and bulgier at the equator. And, um, and then Quito actually means, in a way, equator, because it means the, the area of zero shadow. And the pre-Columbian peoples had already figured out that they were in the equator. And they figured it out in a very intelligent way by using solar clocks. And they knew that if they, you know, if they, if they walked towards the north, the shadows started shifting in a different angle than if they walked towards the south. But in that point, the shadow became zero. Uh, and th that's interesting to me to think that in a way it's not as colonial the name, that maybe it's actually quite ancestral from the perspective of the knowledge and the epistemologies of the indigenous peoples and their obsession with the sun and their capacity to figure out zero and to measure uh, throughout the Western Hemisphere from north to south measure these distances, these angles, and figure out that they were at some line of symmetry. And in that line of symmetry, if you cut a section through the Galapagos Islands, and then the Atlantic Ocean, I mean the Pacific Ocean, and then into the coast of the Pacific, and up the Andes, and down into Amazonia, in this tiny piece of land, we have that fascinating section that has a very strongly, a very strong embedded intelligence, and so strong that it was in the Galapagos, the Darwin figure out natural selection and the mechanism of evolution, looking at the turtles that have very different shells in different islands, depending on how those shells have adapted their form to different vegetation that has also adapted in, in its own turn to a different context and a different environment, and looking at the cormorants and how they have lost their ability to, to fly because there's no functional need to do so. And looking at the Darwin finches as they're knowing now, which also have adapted their beak to different seeds, to different foods that also respond to different ecologies in the different islands. And not far from there in the Amazon, Wallace, another British naturalist, came up to the same exact conclusions in this other ecosystem that has so much embedded intelligence. And that's to mention too, we could mention La Condamine, we could mention Humboldt, you already, uh, well, Sanford already mentioned uh, Humboldt. And all of this has to do with the same territorial intelligence. 
that has been interwoven for thousands of years by Native Americans. And why did I become interested in the Native American world? For very pragmatic reasons. Romanticism is a European invention, and it's actually quite dehumanizing of indigenous peoples. So I'm definitely not a romantic person. It has hypernaturalized places like Amazonia and hypernaturalized the role of these quote unquote passive human beings who live of nature, nature and are either noble savages or brutal savages, but some sort of a primitive uh, subalt, subaltern, if you wish. And it's not like that at all. Now we know things to LIDAR, talk about the role of technology and the type of technology I'm interested in, in terms of what it can be, what can reveal. We know through biogeography and we know through LIDAR that there are ginormous regional in scale cities in Amazonia and that they're probably one of the most interesting, fascinating, complex and defined cities that we have encountered from the perspective of archaeology and city making and the history of cities. 5,500 years of history of the city in the Americas, even though we still call it the New World. And those cities, what attracts me most about them is that they're open and closed, they're rural and urban. Doesn't make sense to speak about rural urban migration because you can be a citizen and a farmer at the same time. In these cities, you can be a hunter, you can be a gatherer, and you can be, you can be an urban spirit. You can simply do it all. In these cities that defy dualism, defy manichaeism, defy binaries, and work as some sort of a constellation of agroecological mosaics where the clusters also allow for functions and specialization and exchange, networks of exchange, which is not just about trade, it's also about cultural and uh, philosophical and spiritual and uh, you know, intermarriage, all sorts of exchange. And those cities have become to me a fascinating obsession because they hold, from my perspective, the seed of a way of reimagining for us the city of the future as we face an ecological emergency. And, uh, and I'm wondering, you know, how can that brilliant indigenous science, indigenous knowledge, indigenous design thinking that is about building and constructing habitats, urban forests, you know, these incredible hybrids don't deny each other, that don't create an otherness, but encompass it all. How can those cities inform the future? And of course, I don't want to idealize them. We know that some of those Native American cities, like for example, here in the Mississippi, Cahokia, um, collapsed due to over a harvesting of resources. And that's probably a strongly Malthusian way of looking at the, cedar, at the city based on limits, you know, limits to growth, for example. Uh, or whether they're environmental or social limits to growth. Uh, there's always technology breaking us away from uh, Malthusian uh, limitations. But uh, on the other hand, we know that the way in which we are walking right now is not going to lead us to a better place uh, in the future. We know that we need to shift. We're looking for answers that have to do with politics, with economy, with city making, because city making is about the economy, it's about politics, but it's also about what you mentioned, Neil. It's also about the ontology, the ideologies of nature, the epistemologies, the way we think about things has a huge impact in the way we live in this world, in the way we make, in the way we think. Uh, so I guess that that's what took me to the indigenous world, a very pragmatic search in which I was continuously disappointed with the history of the of urbanization in, Amazon, in Amazonia from let's say the 17th century with the Jesuits onwards. And it was the pre-Columbian chapter that sort of allowed me to breathe and find hope. And uh, you know, in this spiraling understanding of time, which is not linear, which is not about like past, primitive, backward, present where we are and future, more progressive, more advanced, you know, in a non-linear understanding of time and space, you know, it feels like we're going in this spiraling, in this spiraling in time into a new cycle that is precisely about recovering some of this past knowledge that we have abandoned and in a very arrogant way. 
and that we now need to recuperate because without it, the future looks pretty gloomy, but with it, the future is full of hope. And it is that hope that my territory has given me, which is South American. And I'm very emotional right now because in, in that territory that I so much love, the Ecuadorian government is once again repressing in a very brutal and violent way an indigenous movement that started peacefully to you know, request once again environmental justice, socio-environmental justice, and what has the encounter once again is a lot of racism and systemic violence, not from everyone, of course, but from more people than I wish were demonstrating. You know, we're just bringing these ones again out into the surface. It's something that I wish we could overcome in, in the Americas. We have a very violent history and we still have to reckon with it. And we're already in the 21st century then. Tawantinsuyo was conquered in the 30s in the 16th century. We're heading towards the 500 years of that brutal conquest. And we still have to reckon with the structural, systematic dispossession of a brilliant culture that I'm not going to idealize. We're just humans, we're all humans. But the, the culture that I think personally holds the key to the future of Latin America and maybe to the America, of the Americas and the world. So may my government and the people supporting the government realize that this massacre is completely unacceptable. So thank you, Neil. This, I wish to dedicate this, this, uh, this award to the source of my knowledge, which is Native America. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Anna Marie. Uh, I, I, such a powerful, powerful presentation. You've caught me off my, my guard with that, but uh, congratulations, very well deserved. And I just want to stress how important it is that in, on digital futures, we were interested not just in the technological world, but all the other impacts of all the other concerns that need to be addressed, especially the environment, sea level rise, the exploitation of the Amazon and so on. This has been crucial to what we're doing. So this was such a powerful presentation. Very, very beautiful. Um, so congratulations, Anna Maria. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to also to Sanford for, his, for his, uh, his, his kind words. We'll put them up on our website. And thank you to, to Giovanna for introducing Anna Maria. Gracias. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. So um, uh, we... Uh, we, we now uh, move on to the thing that we had to postpone from the very beginning, um, the collection of voices from our language managers. And I just want to stress how significant that has been uh, this year, the, the idea that somehow that we can open up uh, and, and, and be more inclusive by, uh, by listening to and, and, and drawing upon the incredible intelligence and the ideas that are coming from, from, from the, the, the various languages around the world. So um, uh, we're just gonna play for you um, the video we couldn't play before um, of our language managers. Yes. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Hello to everyone throughout the world My greetings أعتقد أنه يمكن أن تحويل العالم إلى مكان نقدر نعيش فيه مع بعض في سلام وأمان وما أعتقد شيء ده ممكن تحقيقه إلا من خلال مساعدة بعضنا لبعض نقف مع بعض إيدينا في إيدين بعض نتكاتف واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا خاصة في الأوقات الصعبة دي وفي الظروف الاقتصادية الصعبة دي I do think I can turn the world into a place where we can all live in peace and harmony and this can only be accomplished by helping each other and assisting those in need throughout the globe especially in these times when life has become difficult and the economy in crisis أنا أحمد حسب مؤسس المعهد الهندسي للعلوم والتكنولوجيا في أوروبا وأنا مهندس معماري مصري عاشق للتراب الفلسطيني أنا أقدر الفريق العظيم بتاعي على مجهوده وجهوده المتفانية على مدار الأعوام الماضية 
My name is Ahmed Hasab, the founder of Engineering Institute for Integrated Development and Technology in Europe, Egyptian architect. I appreciate my team's extraordinary efforts, contributions, and dedication. نقدر نقول إن إحنا مرحبا بكم في ديجيتال فيوتشر لهذا العام حيث الواقع الافتراضي. <تصفيق> Welcome to Digital Futures 2022 uh, One World. See you in the metaverse. <تصفيق> تحياتي طيبة لكم جميعا. يعني سواء كنتم في مصر أو في القدس أو في أي بلد عربي أو إسلام. مع السلامة. مرحبا بكم في حفل افتتاح Digital Futures 2022. Hello everyone, my name is Aya Riyad. As one of Digital Futures Arabic Regional Managers, I would like to briefly introduce myself. I'm a doctorate candidate at Florida International University and a master's graduate from the DRL program at the AA. I'm the co-founder of Shift Space, an experimental design and research studio based in Dubai and a lecturer at Ajman University. I would like to also take this time to introduce my amazingly talented team Reem Shaheen, a teaching and research assistant of advanced computational design at the American University in Cairo, where she graduated from. Alia Yassin, a graduate of the University of Jordan, and currently a master's candidate at the IA institution, Bauhaus Dessau. And Sara Faraoun, a graduate of IUST University in Damascus and an active researcher locally and internationally. The team has been working hard this summer to put together a handful of exciting workshops for everyone, from leading Arab instructors based in the Arab region and around the world. On behalf of the team, Marhaban Bikum for Digital Futures, Aishreen Atinu Aishreen, Kaukab Wahid, Narakum for Digital Futures, Metaverse. Hola a todos y bienvenidos a Digital Futures One Planet. It's my pleasure to introduce the Spanish language managers. My name is Giovanna Pillaca. I'm the manager of Digital Futures in Spanish language. Also, I'm Peruvian multidisciplinary artist, architect, assistant professor at the UCAL University and co-founder of OLA Research. I have won contests and my work has been exhibited at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Lima and different universities in Latin America too. And I have previously published on Arquinca, Arzeli and Architectural Design. At the beginning of this year, we formed the Digital Futures Spanish Regional Team together with Alberto Fernandez, who is architect, PhD academic at UCH and UCL de Barlet and Sigradis board member. Camila Andino, who is multidisciplinary designer, architect and research. Carlos Rivera, who is founder of Queens of Lab and Onirica Visuas. Roberto Orgeles, who is architect and teacher in University of Guadalajara with whom we have brought together more than 30 Spanish-speaking designers and architects to learn how they are combining speculation and production to propose new approach towards the future of design through different perspectives such as biodesign, architectural intelligence, digital manufacturing, material research, and robotics. Coming from South America, we know that the access to computational design is limited and often even non-exists. So we're very excited to be able to give you a space to learn for free and directly with amazing professionals and many more in this fantastic festival. For that, I would like to say bienvenidos a Digital Futures 2022 y nos vemos en el metaverso de Digital Futures One Planet. Olá, bom dia. I am Angelica Ponzio, Regional Manager of the Portuguese Language Team at Digital Futures. I am an Associate Professor at the Department of Architecture and at the Research and Postgraduate Program in Architecture at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil, where I also graduated as a Doctor in Theory, History and Criticism in Architecture. I am also a proud alumni of the Master of Science in Advanced Architectural Design at GSAPP, Columbia University. Our regional Portuguese team is comprised of Ricardo Cesar Rodrigues, postgraduate in architectural design and building technology, master student in architecture in design process with artificial intelligence at the State University of Londrina, and dashboard designer at Oxford Insight Technologies. 
Sara Sonobai, Specialist in Sustainable Construction at the Federal Technological University of Paraná, Master's Students in Architecture at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Leonardo Prazeres Veloso de Souza, Assistant Professor at the Federal University of Bahia and a Master in Architecture at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Barbara Ruchel Lorenzoni, Master in Design at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul and Doctor in Architecture student at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Sandro Martinez, Doctor in Design student at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul and Master in Architecture for the Graduate Program in Architecture and Urbanism at the Federal University of Pelotas. He is also an Assistant Professor at the Centro Universitário da Região da Campanha. Bem-vindos ao Digital Futures 2022 One Planet. Nos vemos no metaverso do Digital Features. Até lá! سلام خیلی خوش اومدین به مراسم افتتاحی ایونت تابستانی دیجیتال فیچرز ایونتی که خیلی تو ثبت نام کردین و منتظر این شروع بشه ورکشاپ ها بتونین تو کارگاهاتون شرکت کنین امسال موضوعات مختلفی و شامل شده و خیلی جای خوشحالیه که بتونیم ورکشاپ های فارسی داشته باشیم بتونیم به زبون خودمون ورکشاپ برگزار کنیم و افراد معتبری رو داشته باشیم که بتونیم ازشون یاد بگیریم من محمد بهجو هستم مدیر بخش فارسی دیجیتال فیوچرز و امسال در کنار تیم های مختلف دیجیتال فیوچرز از زبون های مختلف داریم فعالیت می کنیم که بتونیم یک ایونت خیلی خوبی رو برگزار کنیم به زبون های مختلفی که در حال حاضر دیجیتال فیوچرز راه اندازی کرده تیم دیجیتال فیوچرز من هستم جناب دکتر همتی هستند کاوه خداوخشی نریمان رفعتی علی رضا سیدی، امیر مهدی بصیری و کیانش میراغایی هستند و جناب آقای مهدی فرد که به صورت موقت دارن به ما فعالیت میکنن برای برگزاری ورکشاپ ها و هماهنگی های یک سری از بخشاشون خیلی از همشون تشکر میکنم سمیمانه و من از این بعد یه چند جمله انگلیسی صحبت میکنم دوباره برمیگردیم و ادامه میدیم Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the Digital Futures. I'm Iran Regional Manager at Digital Futures Board and the Director of Farsi branch of the Digital Futures Board, aka Digital Futures Farsi. We are happy to say that this year we have 12 amazing Farsi workshops with different themes and topics, including artificial intelligence, AR, VR, biodesign, computational design, design fiction, and so on. Emsal. Uh, <coughs> Uh, یه نکته خیلی جالبی داره این uh, قضیه این که قرار تو متاورس هم دیجیتال پیچرز یه فعالیت های جالبی داشته باشه حالا اسمشو گذاشتن وان پلانت uh, یک سیاره و من خوش آمد میگم ورودتون رو به uh, این uh, یک سیاره و امیدوارم تو متاورس دیجیتال پیچرز همه رو ببینیم روز خوبی داشته باشین Merhaba, Digital Futures One Planet açılışlarına hoş geldiniz. Hello and welcome to this year's opening ceremony. As Digital Futures Turkish Regional Manager, I would like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Özge and I'm an architect from Turkey. Currently, I'm writing my master thesis at the Izmir Institute of Technology on the theory of architecture. During my study, I published an article focused on the role of intuition, attended the Azure conference with my paper covering the concept of home and place, and participated in international architecture and design competitions. Now, I am a scholar in an academy where I develop and design games with my team. In there, our game, The Light of the Forest, was chosen in the top 14 from around 400 teams, and we are in the finals now. In addition to that, I am working in the sensory as a graduate intern. I am so excited and happy to be here and cannot wait to see you in Digital Futures Metaverse. Digital Futures Metaverse, görüşmek üzere. Konnichiwa, Digital Futures Nihongo Channel no Sugihara desu. Hello, my name is Satoru Sugihara. I'm the founder of Competition Design Studio ATLB based in Tokyo. I'm the manager of Digital Futures Japanese language branch. I'm honored to be a part of this event and I'm very excited this year to have five workshops held in Japanese. 
which starts tomorrow, as shown on the screen. 日本の皆様、デジタルフューチャー2022、ワンプラネットへようこそ。明日からのオンライン上でのワークショップイベント、いわばデジタルフューチャーズメタバースと呼べるような場での、えー、日本皆様のご参加をお待ちしております。どうぞよろしくお願いします。Greetings, Namaste, Ula, and Yaksata, and I have been associated with the Digital Futures Team for over nine months. I am the co India Regional Manager with my colleague from Kim. We both are affiliated to Balban Shade School of Architecture in Mumbai. Ina Milad Simusi Pasif is affiliated to International University of Saranoro. She is she's also part of the English Workshop Team. The three of us are interested in advanced digital applications in architecture practice and computation within the generative processes of design. And along with this common interest, we have brought together a series of instructors who are so eager to teach all the students about, students about the workshops and about different techniques. And we are really excited for the students as well as the instructors to join for our summer workshops. So, welcome to Digital. Future 2022 One Planet, and we can we will see you in the Digital Futures Metaverse. Goodbye. Hi there, good evening. I'm honored to be the representative of Chinese Workshop Managing Team. My name is Li Keke, one of the Chinese Language Workshop Managing Team. And also a PhD candidate in architecture from Tongji University in Shanghai. And my research interests are in AI augmented architectural design. Also, our team members include Yan Chao, an assistant professor from Tongji University, and Chai Hua, postdoctoral researcher from Tongji University. Sun Tongyue, she got her master's degree from the University of Melbourne and now working as the assistant editor in, of our journal. Architectural Intelligence. Zhou Xinjie, PhD candidate from Tongji University. Here are part of the rest members of our team. We would like to thank all our partners for your contribution to Digital Futures 2022 during the last year. In the future, with one planet as our common goal, we hope to build a better digital futures with our global association members. 欢迎来到 Digital Futures 二零二二，我们在 Digital Futures 元宇宙世界等你。Yeah. Neil, I'll just share the last uh, slides, and we can. Thank you. So I would just like to uh, thank um, the, all our uh, members of Digital Futures, um, all our language managers, um, to, for all all the incredible amount of hard work that's got in. To today's uh, event and to the, the workshops to come,、um, I want us to thank once more. I want to thank Giovanna Palaka for her extraordinary、um, uh, uh, introduction. I want to thank the presenters today. Such a powerful chorus of voices. I was blown away by the energy and the dynamism and the power. Of those voices, this is really what we want to be doing in, in digital futures: to be inspiring future generation with powerful voices, and especially、uh, the female voices. And this was a an incredible, I think, display of 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 how important it is to、um, uh, to presenting powerful ideas in a powerful way. Thank you also to Refik Anadol and and to Sam for Quinter.、Um, uh, so we're going to.、Uh, uh, uh, Wrap up now. It's it's we've got a it's been a very heavy day.、Um, uh, just looking forward to the week ahead.、Um, these are the、uh, these are the the voices that we'll be hearing in the legend series. Having heard the emerging voices, 
these are the established voices who will be uh, part of us who are with us the next week. And this is the, the Legend series is something we're going to carry on. Uh, we weren't able to get everybody uh, to, to be scheduled for next week. So we're going to uh, keep it going. In particular, uh, Peter Cook, we hope to get BB uh, Doshi, uh, Tom Main and, and others, um, and Frank Gehry. We want to keep pushing for this and to, to really make this, the, the, the whole of, of, of the Digital Futures Library, something that is a resource for everyone throughout the world. The aim of Digital Futures is to democratize education. We want to bring important educational ideas to everyone around the world, regardless of their religion, their race, their, their gender, their age, or indeed their economic standing. Thank you for your contribution so far. Thank you to all of those who have, who have been contributing the last, uh, 12, um, the last 12 months. And uh, thank you for those who are going to be teaching workshops over the next few days. Um, uh, it's going to be an astonishing festival. And also, I'd like to thank uh, my colleague, uh, 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 Philip Yuan and his team in Shanghai for contributing to today's uh, conference and uh, the doctoral consortium. I look forward next year to contributing to the doctoral consortium. So um, I, I, if I said, if I, I can't thank anyone and everyone enough, but it's been astonishing. Thank you. And let's finish off with the um, very beautiful um, uh, presentation or jingle that uh, Giovanna and her team have made. Um, thank you, Giovanna. And thank you, Ola, and thank you, the team. Okay, so it's a wrap then. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. We didn't get a photograph. Yes, that's why I was turning my camera on. If oh, everyone okay. wants to join okay, for a sorry. Bye. Okay, let's sorry, but let's, let's bye. put the uh, <laughs> yeah. screenshot of those who are still here. My apologies. I, I it was my fault. Uh, uh, so let's try and get a gallery shot of those who are here. If everyone could turn their cameras on, we can um, get a view. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, I've got to put mine on. Thanks. Aya, we can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you hear me now? Mom, it's not you this time. It's Aya. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay, so we can have a screenshot of that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Have Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Gracias. Ciao.